Hey guys, I'm trying to hit 100k subscribers by the end of the year, and I think we can get there with your help, so please subscribe, it would honestly mean a lot to me. Now, let's get right into the stories. Story 1. I want to tell my son not to wear his favorite pink sparkly jacket to school anymore because it looks gay, but I'm terrified of what that says about me as a father, and I'm scared of how others will treat him when he starts school again. I'm a single dad to my son Oliver, 10 male. He's with me most of the time, and sees his mom every other weekend. He's an awesome kid, creative, full of energy, and he's got his own sense of style that's pretty unique. He loves bright colors, nail polish, and clothes that some people might think are more girly. If I'm honest, I think Oliver might be gay, and I'm totally cool with that. I've always made it clear that whoever he turns out to be, I'll support him 100%. Because of how he dresses and acts, Oliver's had a really tough time with other kids. He got bullied so badly at his old school that I ended up pulling him out and homeschooling him. The school wasn't helpful at all, and it was heartbreaking to see him go through that. He struggled to make friends, and it kills me to see him feel so alone. Now, he's starting back at school in September, and he's really excited about it. But recently, we were at a cousin's birthday party, and Oliver wore his favorite jacket which is a bright pink, sparkly one that he loves. Some of the other kids started picking on him, saying he looked gay. I stepped in, got the kids to apologize, but it still ruined the day for Oliver. I'm worried about how things will go when he's back at school. I've been thinking about whether I should talk to Oliver about maybe toning it down a bit, especially when he's around new people. Not because I want him to change who he is, but because I hate seeing him get hurt and feel like an outcast all the time. I don't want him to feel like he has to hide who he is, but I also don't want him to be picked on or excluded because of it. But then, I feel like a complete jerk for even thinking about this. I don't want him to think that I'm ashamed of him or that he has to conform to be accepted. I want him to feel free to be himself, but I'm also scared of him being hurt by others who don't get it. Am I going too far if I talk to Oliver about maybe being a bit more low-key with his style? I really don't know how to approach this or if I even should. Relevant comments. Commenter, don't do it. Do not dull his shine because other people don't understand him. Kids will still bully him and all he will remember is that you deterred him from expressing himself. Trust me, the same thing occurred in our house. I was trying to keep him from being bullied, but my child felt as though I didn't accept him and that he needed to pretend he was something he wasn't. Lots of later life therapy, if he's gay, if he's straight, let him be himself and tell him as long as he likes his clothes, that's all that matters. Sincerely, the mom of an amazing queer kid. Oop, I get that, but at the same time it is so heartbreaking seeing the same thing happen to him over, and over, and over again. Update almost one month later, hey all, it's been about 26 days since my original post, and I thought I'd give an update now that Oliver has had his first week back at school. I can happily say that so far, things are going much better than I'd hoped. Over the summer, Oliver and I had a really important heart-to-heart. -heart. I sat him down and told him just how incredibly proud I am of the person he is becoming. I made sure he knew that there is absolutely nothing he could ever do that would change the way I see him or make me love him any less. Honestly, it was a bit emotional, and I even got a bit choked up. I told him that if wearing his favorite jacket, the one that's caused some hurt before, made him happy, I'd stand behind him 100%. But I also wanted to make sure he was prepared. I explained that, while I'll always be there for him, I can't always be around to protect him, and he might have to stand up for himself if kids make fun of him. I made it clear that this doesn't mean he should change anything about who he is but that he needs to be ready to handle it if anyone says anything cruel. Oliver understood, and we spent the rest of the summer coming up with some playful comebacks together. He really wanted to take the jacket with him to school, so we made it a bit of a project, imagining the kind of things kids might say and crafting witty replies that he could fire back with. It was actually pretty fun, and I think it helped him feel more confident about it. Now, back to school. His new teacher knows all about his past struggles with bullying, and she's been amazing. She's keeping a close eye on things and making sure he feels safe and comfortable. It's made such a difference already, and Oliver's first week couldn't have gone better. He's even made a friend, a boy named Sam, and they've really hit it off. They're planning to meet up tomorrow at the Wacky Warehouse, and Oliver can't stop talking about it. It's been a long time since I've seen him this excited about spending time with someone his age. I know it's still early days, but seeing him come home happy and smiling each day has been such a relief. Thanks to everyone who gave advice and encouragement on my original post, I really took a lot of it to heart, and I think it made a big difference in how I approached all this. Update two days later, hey, I just wanted to hop on and give a small update about Oliver's playdate over the weekend. Firstly, when Oliver was getting ready he wanted to wear all his flamboyant clothes. He asked me if I thought it was a good idea, his friend had seen him in his jacket but he was a little worried how he would react to the full Oliver. I told him to wear whatever he wanted, and if this friend was worth being friends with they would accept him for exactly how he is. This made Oliver smile. He wore his full Oliver outfit, when we were walking and I could feel Oliver getting a bit nervous. He was bullied so much in his last school for how he was, so I understood why. I held his hand tight and gave it two squeezes, this means I love you, something I learned to teach him from Reddit actually. The friend's dad was with him and he looked at Oliver and gave a little curious look but apart from that it was fine. The boy said he loved Oliver's clothes. They spent about four hours playing, and we ended up eating together. On the way home, I told Oliver how proud I am of the little man he is. I am so proud how he is so willing to be himself, and so brave to continue despite any backlash he gets. 
I couldn't have been as brave as him when I was that young. I love him so much. I don't know if I'll ever show you these posts Oliver, maybe in a few years when you're older so we can laugh at how worried I was about you. Your dad is so proud of you, I think you are the most amazing person in the whole world. Even when you drive me absolutely nuts. I am so lucky to get to be your father, and I am so lucky you are in my life. Story 2 I've been raising my kids on my own ever since my ex-wife disappeared into a drug-fueled mess, but now I've fallen for her sister who's still grieving her late husband, and I'm terrified of ruining the only real family we've got left. I, 32 male, am finally at a point where I can't stand this anymore. I've been in love with this woman, 27 female, for a very long time, maybe a couple of years at this point and I'm not sure if I should just kill it or attempt to make something with her. I met my ex-wife, her sister, when I was 23 years old and the relationship developed very quickly and by 26 I had my son and daughter and had gotten married. However, within months of being married my ex-wife had an affair, but worse than that, the man she cheated with gotten her into some hard drugs. After confronting her on this she said she was going to get help, but instead she left in the night. I haven't heard from her in 4 years and last I've heard she's still with that guy and are homeless in Las Vegas. Not sure how true that is, but being focused on holding it together for the kids, I really don't have the time to chase her down, nor do I even want to after what she pulled. I ended up getting a divorce in absentia. I did however maintain a very positive relationship with my in-laws after the fact. Every other weekend my kids stay over with their grandparents on that side and they pretty much treat me like a son still, I still go to parties at Christmas and I'm reasonably liked by the family. Nobody talks about my ex anymore mainly to not worry my kids. My oldest, my son, is very hurt by his mother leaving. He's nine now and I've had to get therapy for him after he told me he hoped his mother was dead. She had been getting verbally abusive toward the end which was when he was around five or six. Anyhow, in the year following my ex leaving, her sister and her boyfriend had started coming around a lot to see the kids. They knew I worked a lot and would babysit and call it practice as they wanted to have children of their own. My kids loved them and were spoiled by them, which I didn't mind because we all needed a little positivity. They got married and were very in love. However, her husband was unalived in a workplace accident shortly after the birth of their daughter. It has been extremely rough and painful for everyone involved as one can imagine. I followed my sister-in-law's example and began to take her daughter to give her time to herself if things got too hard to deal with or she needed alone time. She's been in grief counseling for a few years but she still wears her ring and has told me she can't ever imagine dating again. I talk to her about him frequently and she's gotten to a better place but she's still very much in love with him, I can't imagine that sort of pain. Over the last two years we've been a more constant figure in each other's lives. My kids love their aunt and I have her over for dinner a couple times a week. My daughter and her daughter have become close and love being around each other so they have sleepovers. I've moved on from my ex by this point but the idea of dating possibly someone as dangerous as their mother has kept me out of the dating scene. I don't know when it happened, but slowly I began to get soft on my sister-in-law. She's a great mom for what she's had happened to her. She's one of the sweetest people I know and her sense of humor always leaves me laughing and happy. Then I started realizing that I'm physically attracted to her. I've always felt kind of guilty about it because her late husband was a good friend and since she's obviously is still grieving, I've kept it to myself. Since COVID started we've been together a bit more because social distancing has had us lose contact with most other people. Nothing romantic has ever been discussed and I try not to flirt, but last week it was very late and after the kids went to bed I made us a few drinks, not enough to get drunk but she decided she'd rather spend the night, so I took my couch. I woke up to breakfast this morning and the four of us felt like the sort of family I've always wanted. She even kissed my forehead which is not something she normally does. I still didn't say anything, but after she left I found my son quietly playing with his toys in his room. He looked upset so I asked him if he was alright. He tells me point blank in the way only a kid can that he wishes sister-in-law was his mother. I sat down with him and asked him why he thought that way and he gave a whole bunch of reasons, like her being nice to him, and she never yells about anything. He likes seeing her at his grandparents and she draws pictures with him, which I didn't know they did. By the end of it my heart that is already melting for this woman even more wound up. When visiting dropping them off with her grandparents, I tried to breach the subject with her folks to kind of feel around how people would see. I made a joke about she and I acting like a married couple sometimes and they didn't laugh and were kind of standoffish, friendly but either they know something or they disapprove. It's getting too hard for me to ignore or pretend it's not getting to me. I'm in love with her. Either I've got to kill it and find some way not to think of her, or I have to find some sort of way to navigate through this situation and tell her everything. If anybody out there has any insight on how to approach a widow, especially one who was married to a friend, with this sort of intention I could really use your help. Update 2 months later. Firstly I'd like to thank everyone who gave me advice on how to proceed and ideas and things I could maybe say to my former sister-in-law. What I ended up doing. Shortly after making the first post, I remembered that my children would spend Sunday night over their grandparents' house, and typically when they do this, my niece, sister-in-law's daughter, will join them. I allow these bi-weekly visits because I think it's important for them to maintain a healthy relationship with their mother's parents. And sister-in-law lets her daughter go because she enjoys playing with my daughter. Well I realized we'd both have a free night. Normally I'd just game or hit the gym an extra night but I figured it would be the perfect opportunity to my sister-in-law without the kids being around. So I sent her a text saying hey, kids are out this Sunday, was thinking you might want to get dinner. It was a fairly upscale place that reopened two months or so ago for outdoor dining. 
I never ask her out to dinner and we're almost never alone together, or without a child in the other room. She says she'd love to and so my panic starts setting in because now I've got to actually act on my feelings. I ask her if she'd prefer meeting at my place and taking one car or meeting at the restaurant, and she says she'll come by my place first. I'm a bit more cleaned up than normal, dressed up but not overly dressed. She shows up and my god, she's in a very nice evening dress, makeup, not something she normally wears, really looking stunning. I must have been slack-jawed for a second, I had to be lol. We make a little small talk compliment how we look but I still don't have my nerve yet and she isn't pushing the issue. Dinner is really wonderful, they had a live jazz type group playing. Definitely coming back to this place. She tells me this is the first time she's really had an adult social outing that didn't involve her daughter in a few years and I mentioned that it's about as long for me. We're laughing, joking, talking, a little casual touching here and there. I can't seem to find my nerve though, I'm afraid of ruining this moment, so I just submit to having fun. But as we're leaving my mind snaps and I'm just like screw it. And when we stand to go back to the car, I give her my arm and we walk back to the car arm and arm no awkwardness, nobody mentioning that it's happening. I open her door for her and I plan on driving her back to her car. As I open the door she stops me. Looking sort of nervous, she just outright tells me to stop and that she wants to kiss me. There was no alcohol at dinner so this is all her. So I pull her in and we kiss. I can barely describe how wonderful it felt to finally touch her. While well, the kissing goes on outside this restaurant with her leaned against my car for at least a half an hour. When we finally break we share a few more dreamy looks before we get in the car and drive back to my place. She's holding my hand as I'm driving, I don't think I've ever been happier. I seriously felt that teenage first love feeling again. I confess to her that I've started having feelings for her a long time ago but with the terrible things we went through I didn't want to scare her away. She tells me that she's carried a torch for about 6 months herself. At that time I had gone on a couple Tinder dates and since we were just friends I described what a mess of a time those dates were. She tells me she began feeling intensely jealous and angry that I was seeing these girls, and it was about that time it clicked in her mind that she had somehow developed feelings for me. As it turns out I didn't approach her because of her late husband and she wasn't approaching me because she was afraid I'd see too much of her sister, my ex-wife, in her and start to resent her for it. I invited her in after we got back home and we decided to try and fight off the desire to jump straight into bed, and just sat on the couch snuggling and talking about what we would need to do to make this a working relationship. There were some really teary moments there. We of course talked about her late husband a little and where she feels in the grief process saying I don't want to rush her and that I'm not going anywhere if she needs time, I'll wait as long as she needs me to. She says that she feels like she's in a place where she could love again, that she's long past feeling guilty for having feelings for me, it was something she struggled with. She then brought up her sister, and the obvious questions a few people asked in the comments. What would we do if my ex ever decided to show her face around here again or try to get back into my kid's life? What if she comes back reformed and apologetic would I take her back? I told sister-in-law that's a hard no, that I've forgiven her for cheating on me, but I will never forgive her for what she did to my son. He was quite a sunshiny and happy boy before his mother started cheating, using, and lashing out at him. He's doing better now, but for a long while his behavior and negativity for somebody so young troubled me. My sister-in-law was concerned how he might react to her as unlike our respective daughters he is old enough to understand everything. I told her not to tell him as it might embarrass him, but not too long ago he told me as wished his aunt was his mom instead. We said we were going to take it slow and not go too fast with things, but the kissing started again and since we were in private this time. We gave up the fight to stay out of the bedroom. I have had fantasies throughout the duration of my feelings for her, and getting to pet her face in the morning was one I finally got to live out. Moving forward, we are going to establish date nights and work on building on our already strong foundation. When we inevitably tell our folks we're a couple we're going to do it together. But that's where I'm at. That's it, that's my update. Maybe I'll do another to say how the parents, in-laws, and kids take the news. Two years of wishing she was mine and now she is. Better not screw this up. Second update one week later, I am referring to my ex-wife as Jessica and my sister-in-law, who I had been calling sister-in-law, to Sylvia because funny. Well we've told everyone, and for the most part it's gone over fairly well. When our respective kids were with my in-laws, Sylvia and I went to go see my parents. They've met her a handful of times but they don't really know her too well as my in-laws and my family rarely attended mutual functions they at least recognized who she was. My dad isn't a particularly sentimental person so I have no idea what he thinks about it, but my mother is on board. She did ask does Jess know? And we told her that I haven't even spoken with her in four years and Sylvia hasn't heard from her in two, that we'd cross that bridge when we got to it. Other than that my folks just seemed happy for me. Yesterday we attended a small family gathering for Labor Day at my in-laws. We knew the reception here would be a little more chilly as they're all also related to my ex-wife. My parents did us the favor of taking the kids to the zoo for the afternoon and ice cream too. We arrived at the party together and of course everybody is wondering where the kids are. Felt like a million things were telling me not to do this, but I took her by the hand and we both explained the kids were not here because we intended on telling everyone that we are now a couple. This wasn't a huge crowd, maybe like 8 people but it really felt like I announced it to a stadium. I don't know how we expected it to go but several of her aunts were very pleased with this. We got some hugs. At first nobody even mentioned my ex-wife. They were just happy because they had all settled on Sylvia just never dating again. It was only mother-in-law that caused any issues. 
She told the party that she knew we were an item because I was always giving her puppy dog eyes and told them Sylvia talked about me nonstop. She asked for how long we had been dating in secret and I told her only a week. She scoffed and told me that she didn't think starting a relationship off by lying would be a smart move. She then accused, albeit it in a joking manner to the guests that Sylvia and I had vanished at a pool party in June to smooch. Her mother and father asked to talk with us after the party and asked us just how serious things were, and like my parents asked whether my ex-wife knew or not. When I said no and that her opinion shouldn't matter given she abandoned her family four years ago, they said they would be more comfortable with everything if I was to tell Jessica that I am now dating her sister. They are both intensely afraid that my ex will return sober and renewed, make an attempt to make amends, discover that I am now in love with her younger sister and relapse. It sounded to me as if they knew something I didn't and as it turns out Jess has been calling and talking to them for a year now and they just haven't told me, I was upset they kept this from me. Sylvia was very upset too, because not once after her husband's death has Jess ever tried to call her. They show me her Facebook profile, the one she blocked me from and there she is looking pretty normal, not like a burned out husk. I have to admit that seeing her not looking like the junkie she became when she left made me feel a little better and Sylvia too. Her parents kept their contact with her a secret because she is ashamed of what she's done and feels that she's deserved to lose her kids and and couldn't face them after all that happened. Sylvia's parents gave me her phone number and asked that I please call her and speak with her. I told her that my feelings for Sylvia are real and there is no chance I reconcile with Jess. My father-in-law seemed to nod in approval, but Mill honestly looks like she was hoping we'd fix things. After we left I talked to Sylvia about it, and though we discussed it before, a circumstance where Jess returns, we decided to revisit the conversation in light of these new revelations. I told Sylvia that I am in love with her, my whole heart is hers and that my feelings of love for her are something deeper and stronger than anything I ever felt for my ex-wife. She ends up crying from the stress of the situation, anger with her parents for keeping secrets, and anger with her sister for not calling her or offering condolences at all after her husband's death. She then admits that she is afraid I might leave her if her sister returns and I assure her this will never happen. It took some long hugs and a lot of kisses to smooth over the situation but by the time we went to pick up the kids, we were holding hands together again and feeling more connected than ever. She's been spending the night at my place pretty frequently since we've been together. So that the kids don't see anything, I've been setting my alarm for 5 in the morning, getting up and moving to the couch. Well the morning after we decided to tell the little ones what is going on. Our daughters seemed very happy but they are too young to really grasp what's actually taking place, all they know is they can play together more. I did take my son aside, just me and him and asked him if he was okay with this and what he thought about it. He asked if we'd all be living together, I told him maybe someday. He asked if this made his aunt his stepmom now and I said he's free to call her what he's comfortable with and I will respect it and she would too because we both love him. He then asked me a lot of questions about his own mother, things he had never asked me before and I answered pretty much everything he wanted to know. I toned some of my answers down a bit. He's learned a little about the dangers of drugs from school programs and I was finally honest to that degree when I told him his mom had a problem and she made some bad choices. He asked me why his mother didn't love him and that broke my heart. I assured him the best I could that his mother did love him, she had just made a lot of terrible mistakes and that sometimes adults just don't do the right thing when they should. He asked me if I still loved her. I told him that I hoped she would get better and that I don't want her to be sick anymore, but that she hurt me and him so badly that I couldn't love her like I did before. I'm not sure he got all of that, but I tried explaining it to him the best I could. All that aside he has been so much happier and less withdrawn since Sylvia has been with us and he's always going out of his way to do all the typical kid stuff to impress her that I did with my own mom. At the end of the day I still have that phone call with the ex to dread. But, having Sylvia with me, being able to kiss her and hold her at night, it really puts some joy back into me that's been gone for a very long time. I don't think I even knew how unhappy I'd been all these years until I realized how happy she made me feel. We've been doing all the happy young lover stuff. She's been leaving me love letters in my work lunchbox, even little poems, and I had flowers sent to her place of work. She mentioned she had told me that a few of the ladies at work had been trying to get her to ask me out for several months, so I figured the flowers would both make her happy and be a firm. Thank you to the office girls lol. Thank you for everyone who commented or sent me messages on the first and second posts, they really made my day and helped me keep my cool to confess to her. Feel free to ask me anything, but I think this just about does it for my updates. Third update two months later, people have been asking me for an update for a couple months now so I figured I'd finally sit down and do one. What you're about to read is a comment I wrote like last week and I've just copied and pasted it as it's pretty much good enough to be a post. It details for the phone call with my ex-wife went and a little more info. I did talk to her a couple months ago, I keep going to write an update for this, but life got pretty hectic. I did write like a 10 paragraph update like a month ago, but my laptop crashed, so I lost it and got discouraged. The ex-wife is in a much better place and is in recovery. 8 months clean by this point. She finally told me the details of the affair and how things happened, how she got into drugs. Not stuff I really wanted to hear, but she's trying to get her life together and as much as I dislike the things she's done to me and the kids I want her to get healthy. I shouldn't but I worry about her still sometimes. Anyhow I got around to telling her about Sylvia and I and she was dumbfounded by it. When I first met my ex she was 19 and Sylvia was 14 and in her mind she always viewed her as a kid in regards to me, which to be fair I did use to refer to Sylvia and her kid sister. But when she remembered that her sister is a fully grown adult who was married and had a child that her hinting I was a creep stopped. She did ask if I had feelings for her while I was married and I denied that. 
We talked about the kids and she was really regretful and crying throughout the conversation. She has no idea how she'd be able to face them again. I wanted to say something reassuring, but I don't want to give her the impression that I want her in their lives. Cordial, even friendly, but I'm not going to be stupid. She and Sylvia talked for a while too. I didn't eavesdrop intentionally, but from the bits I heard and what I was told, they talked about Sylvia's husband. As it turns out my ex had gotten arrested for a breaking and entering that week and spent it in jail. She didn't even know he passed until a couple weeks after the funeral and by that point she felt saying anything would make things worse. Things went as well as could be expected. Sylvia, the three kids, and I have been spending almost every day together and I haven't been happier in years. My son and daughter love all the motherly attention they've been getting and I'm really loving getting to learn more about my little niece. Life's good. Busy, but it's good. Thanks for asking. If anybody has any questions or comments I'd be happy to answer what I can when I can, but during this season my workload increases dramatically and I don't have as much time to be on here as I did when I first posted. I'm so glad I got up the nerve to try with her. I love her so much. I've been so long without a romantic partner, that I forgot what being in love, or feeling loved felt like. Now that I remember, it's shocking to me I didn't realize how alone and miserable I really was. I mean for Christ's sake we played Scrabble last night and for some reason it made me ridiculously happy lol. Fourth update one year later, it has nearly been a year since my former sister-in-law, Sylvia, and I decided to begin dating. A year later and we are living together and I couldn't be happier. We're currently living together and are in the market for a new home. Our children are really benefiting from having two parents around to care for them. Our daughters have begun to call each other sisters and my son is accepted in the same way. They're basically just normal siblings. It is interesting with my son. When he is talking to his friends or teacher he refers to Sylvia as his mom, but when calling her or talking to her he still calls her auntie, and our daughters are the same as I am uncle. It confuses some people we meet, but it's always an interesting story to tell. We haven't had much contact with my ex-wife since my last post, though from what we hear she's doing much better. Has a halfway decent job, a boyfriend, and is keeping clean. I don't like to think about her being reintroduced into my children's lives, but if she continues to be a clean and well-rounded person, it will make it much harder for me to deny her visitation should she seek it. Not just from a legal standpoint, but from a moral one as well. Neither Sylvia and I look forward to that day, but the worries seem way off. Her parents have stopped their prodding into our business and haven't tried to force the ex back into our lives as we feared. Our kids spend the weekend with them now as my two are already doing that beforehand. So Sylvia and I get to spend Friday night and most of Saturday to go on dates and have some alone time. Our mutual friends were all pretty surprised by this and have been very supportive as well. They try to be polite and not mention my ex-wife, but every so often it does come up. Mostly everyone is just happy that we've found happiness together. One side of the family that I failed to mention in all of this was the family of her late husband. As you might expect her daughter still sees them regularly, and they are very happy and accepting of the relationship. His father even told me point blank that he was glad it was me, because he thought he would hate his daughter-in-law bringing some strange man into his granddaughter's life. We haven't had many gatherings but the few get-togethers we have had have included them, and will always include them. Speaking of her late husband, Sylvia and I have talked quite a bit about our feelings and she's even had me come along to one of her therapy sessions, because despite everything going so well, and the immense and wonderful love we have for each other, his memory and presence will always be a part of our lives. She decided on her own that out of respect for me she had to take her wedding band off, something that caused a lot of sadness as you can imagine. I told her that she didn't need to do this and were we to get married, she's got two hands. After I said this she began to wear it on a necklace instead. She wears an engagement ring now. I don't have any crazy story on how the engagement went down I didn't spring it on her in some crazy public spectacle, but there were tears and hugs and kisses. Thank everyone so much for all the positive words of encouragement. Story 3 My sister banned my boyfriend from her wedding because I refused to walk down the aisle with her creepy future brother-in-law, and now I'm stuck deciding whether to go without him or ditch the whole thing. I, 25 female, met my boyfriend, 26 male, in college 7 years ago, and we started dating 5 years ago. He is super close and loving with my family. He was there at my niece's births, baptisms, Christmas, vacations, etc. We are extremely committed to each other for the long run, but don't want to get married until we are financially stable and both our careers are where we want them to be. My sister, 31 female, has been with her fiancé for two years and engaged for six months now. My sister is the type of girl who has dreamed of getting married since she was a little girl. It didn't matter who proposed, she just wanted to be married. I have never cared if I got married or not, as long as I have a good career and a happy relationship I'm fine. In the beginning of her relationship she tricked me into going on a double date with her fiancé and his brother. She had said it was dinner with her and a friend, and it was most definitely not. The brother kept making passes at me the whole time and I told him I had a boyfriend and the whole situation made me very uncomfortable. At their engagement party my boyfriend noticed that the brother wouldn't stop staring at me and we tried our best to avoid him. Every time I have seen this guy he has been weird towards me. My sister wanted me, my fraternal twin, and two brothers in her wedding. The wedding is supposed to be next month in the beginning of May. My sister just told me that I'm going to be walking down the aisle with her fiancé's brother. I told her that he makes me uncomfortable and I thought I would be walking with my own brother. Apparently this is something her fiancé is insisting and she wants to make him happy. 
Seems like a pretty weird thing to insist, and I know it's some scheme between the two brothers. My other siblings also thought it was weird and voiced their objections to our sister. She got upset and said this is her wedding and she'll do what she wants. I told my boyfriend this and he was upset for me. He's confident enough in himself that he knows this guy would never be competition, but he knows how uncomfortable I am with this situation. The other day we had family dinner at my mom's house. I took this as an opportunity to bring up the all situation with my mother around. My sister got extremely upset and started crying saying I was trying to ruin her marriage. I was so confused, as was everyone else, and tried to explain that he makes me and my boyfriend extremely uncomfortable. She then said that I can't bring my boyfriend to her wedding anymore and if I do then I'm no longer a bridesmaid. She gave no reason as to why I can't bring him and my siblings were just as upset considering they like my boyfriend a lot better than my sister's fiancé. I thought I would give her a few days to calm down and rethink but she has not changed her mind. My 19-year-old brother's girlfriend is still invited to the wedding. My boyfriend is an incredible guy and has been nothing but kind and generous to my sister. His feelings are hurt but he still wants me to go to the wedding. I think my sister is being an unreasonable jerk and I will be pretty pissed off at the wedding if my life partner is not there with me. Being her bridesmaid is something I can live without, so should I bring my boyfriend or go without him? Or should I demand that my boyfriend be allowed to come to her wedding and that she's being super unfair? I love my sister but I don't understand why she's forcing some silly request by her creepy brother-in-law. I don't know what to do and my family is no help either. Update 5 days later, most of the comments said I shouldn't go to the wedding at all, but she is my sister and I don't want to miss her wedding. I went to my parents' house with my brothers and told them about everything the brother-in-law has done that makes me super uncomfortable and how my sister is disrespecting my relationship. My dad was pretty pissed off about the date stunt that she pulled and is on my side. My mom, however, says that I need to try and resolve this with her because if I am not part of the wedding party, people will talk. I honestly couldn't give a crap about what extended family has to say. My mom called a family meeting and told my sister and my twin to come to the house. My dad asked her why I was no longer walking with my brother, to which she responded saying that it's what her fiancé wants and she just wants to make him happy. I pressed the issue asking why is this such a big deal for me to walk with him and that he's super weird and I wouldn't be surprised if he tried to assault me. That really pissed her off. She started crying and yelling saying a bunch of bull crap how this is all she's ever wanted and we're trying to ruin her special day, blah blah blah. I was tired of the arguing and just straight up said I'll go to the wedding as a guest, then I'm leaving before the reception. My twin and younger brother took my side and said they don't want to be in the wedding party if I'm not. This made my sister lose her freaking mind. She was screaming now, calling me a bunch of names that I can't say on this sub, and also calling my boyfriend names. I decided to leave and let my parents calm her down, but before I could walk out she ran at me and yanked my hair, still screaming. She wouldn't let go, so I yanked hers too and she finally let go. She has extensions and apparently I messed them up, and ripped some hair out. She tried to grab me again, so I striked her in the face. I didn't even mean to hit her it was just my instant reaction to someone coming at me. So now she has a black eye, a cut on her cheek, and she's missing some hair. She's absolutely livid because her bachelorette party is next week. My mom is mad at me, my dad is not. My sister is now saying that she's going to press charges against me. Can she actually do that or is she just trying to scare me? She's also pissed off because my other siblings won't be in the wedding. She told my mom if I apologize to her and agree to be in the wedding she'll let me walk with my brother. I feel like that is bull crap and she will still make me walk with the brother-in-law last minute. At this point I feel like it's not worth the trouble and I just don't want to go at all. My mom and dad want me to do what she asked because they're paying for the wedding and want all their kids there. My twin and younger brother said they'll do whatever I want to do, but I don't think I should be the reason they don't go. My boyfriend feels like he started all this drama when none of it is his fault. My sister believes I ruined her wedding, she ruined it herself, and I don't know what to do. So basically the options are go to the wedding as a guest, be in the wedding, or not go at all. My parents will be upset if I don't go, and I really don't want any more tension, but she disrespected me in my relationship. As soon as this wedding is over I am going to limit my contact with her for a while. Final update almost one month later, the first part of this is written before the wedding and the second part will be after the wedding. First off I want to say I didn't know this post had blown up like it did until a few days ago. I've heard tons of crazy theories and lots of people saying they hope my sister attacks me again or I should get her arrested or scream rope at her wedding. While these are all interesting this is unfortunately my real life and not a movie. I will try and clear up any questions in this post. Some people ask if race is an issue and it's not. My family is French and Puerto Rican. My boyfriend is Italian and my sister's fiancé is just white, I don't know what his ethnicity is. There was also some confusion about my siblings. I am one of five kids. My twin is a girl, I guess that got misunderstood when I said two girls two guys I meant that besides my sister getting married, there was four of us walking down the aisle. I kept saying twin instead of sister so she wouldn't get confused with the one getting married. My sister is second oldest. Also don't think money is an issue either. My family's not rich just middle class. The reason her wedding is getting paid for and not mine is because she didn't go to college and I did. They paid for the majority of my tuition, and I don't want a big fancy wedding either. 
Some people also ask why they don't revoke their money from her for this behavior but the wedding has already been paid for for a while so there's no getting their money back. My sister did have a black eye still at her bachelorette party and changed the venue to a darker place and she wore lots of makeup. My twin brothers and me and my boyfriend went to the club that night instead and had a fabulous time and got trashed. I heard from her friend that she was telling everyone she got hit with a car door and not my fist. My sister has always been a bit unhinged. When she was in high school her and my twin used to fight all the time. Every breakup my sister has ever had she has broke down and shut down completely and felt her life is over. I've seen this since she was 12. I used to get in lots of arguments with my parents over them excusing her behavior which ultimately made me decide to go to college across the country. During college I rarely talked to her. When I came back home she had matured and our relationship has been good for a while. She still occasionally has huge meltdowns over small things like this wedding. I sent my future brother-in-law a text asking why him and his brother are so obsessed with me to which he didn't respond to. Me and my dad went down to his place and he said my sister was the one who kept telling him that I was interested and would leave my boyfriend for him. So I don't even know which one of them came up with this plan. My dad got mad and told him to leave me and my boyfriend the hell alone. So I have told my sister to go to therapy for years and she's refused. I tried to have my mom see if she can get her to go to family therapy with me and he also refused but said she would talk with me and my mom. When her and her fiancé first started dating she brought him to a work New Year's party and he brought his brother and I also attended. This was her first boyfriend that had shown any interest in getting married one day. I guess the brother had said he found me very attractive and my sister instantly jumped the gun on that. She told him that I was not in a serious relationship, I had been with my boyfriend for three years at that point, and he had a strong chance with me and he's just my type, wrong. So he's been under the impression that my boyfriend is just a placeholder which is extremely not the case. He's just as delusional as my sister. This made no sense to me why she did this because my twin is single. We are fraternal so we don't look the same and we're different heights with very different personalities but she's still a very pretty girl and single. My sister has expressed some jealousy of my relationship over the years so I guess that could be a factor in her trying to break us up. She's always made comments about how she'll never have what I have with my boyfriend. About a month ago, right before her ultimatum, she found out she's pregnant. I didn't know, she thinks if she doesn't make this brother thing happen then her fiancé will leave her and being a single mom is more frightening for her than her family hating her. It's still early enough that she does have other options but she's committed to this for some reason. This was an intense conversation and also talked about other things so this was all I could get out of her before my patience ran out. I did kinda snap on her and said some things along the lines of sorry you're so pathetic that you date any guy who looks at you and you still can't find a good relationship and I can. You will be divorced before labor. Yes it was a little mean but I was very heated in the moment and wanted to say something worse. My boyfriend is very adamant about us going to the wedding despite all the bull crap my sister is putting him through. My boyfriend doesn't have close relationships with his siblings and has always loved being a part of this family. He wants me to maintain a relationship with mine so I don't regret it later. He's still hurt though that my sister has been going through these great lengths to get him out of the picture. I've tried to reassure him the best I can that everyone still loves him and I always will. We're going for the ceremony as guests and then leaving as soon as they say I do. My two brothers and twin sister are walking together as a trio. We took wedding pictures together at a park so our parents could have something of all of us, and we look good. They haven't decided yet if they're staying for the whole wedding but they're gonna feel it out. My older brother is staying the whole time so he can watch the brother and have some words with him. A lot of people said to have my boyfriend propose at her wedding but I don't care enough to deliberately try and ruin her wedding. That will not make the situation better in the slightest and I honestly don't ever want a public proposal and I think that's super tacky. Me and my boyfriend have just been enjoying us and not worrying about any of this bull crap. I'm not worried about my sister attacking me again and if she does I can easily kick her butt. She can't fight for the life of her which is why I don't know why she fucked around in the first place. Also some people said isn't it incest if sisters date brothers but it is not at all, and I have cousins who are married to sisters. Not excusing the behavior just saying that's not incest at all. After wedding. So, the wedding. I showed up in my bridesmaid dress because I wasn't gonna go and buy another one and it's a very nice dress. Me and my boyfriend tried to go in as late as we could to limit the amount of family asking me why I'm not in the wedding. A few aunts and uncles asked and I just said my sister lost her mind and to ask her. I tried to stay with some cousins who I told what happened and know how my sister is an occasional nut. The ones who knew that my boyfriend's invite was revoked were pissed considering some of their plus ones were just dates. We sat in the front row where my sister, her husband, and the brother could see me with my very serious, handsome, amazing, loving boyfriend. He held my hand the whole time and made sure I was okay. This wedding just confirmed me not wanting a big wedding. We can have a party at most. It was only once that the brother was staring at me and I quickly shut that down by kissing my boyfriend. As soon as they all walked back down the aisle I said my goodbyes to the people that deserved it and we left. We went to a bar and danced and had a good time. I'm glad I went to the wedding so I can say I told you so when this marriage ends in six months. I'm glad that delusional sob saw me kissing the man I love because that will never be him. My twin had quite a few drinks at the wedding and was being very mouthy with my sister. I didn't ask her to say something but she would have done that with or without booze. 
My younger brother told almost every family member that my sister went apes crap on me and that's why I wasn't at the reception. My older brother did talk to the brother-in-law but I don't know what he said. I didn't ask many other questions and this is just what they told me. I feel really bad for my sister honestly. She baby trapped herself with a Sapar bottom feeder. That man has zero qualities that would make me jump through all these hoops. He has the personality of an Adidas sandal. I wish my sister had more self-respect and raised her standards. I don't know much about their relationship and if he's abusive. I would like to think that she at least has that much respect for herself to not put up with that. Maybe they're in love, maybe he's using her. Who knows? This marriage may not last but she's now attached to him for at least the next 18 years. While I sort of get her reasoning for not wanting to be a single mom, my brother is a single dad and doing just fine. I don't plan on talking to her for quite a while. I don't know how things turned out for them for not getting me with the brother. After prying they still wouldn't give me clear answers so I don't know how serious the husband actually is about his loser brother getting laid. Those brothers were either neglected or breastfed till they were teens. I was already going on vacation this summer with my boyfriend but I might extend it now, who knows, I may even get married in France for craps and giggles. Anyway thanks for all the support sorry that this ending wasn't as dramatic as you all wanted it to be. I'm not expecting an apology I honestly don't care anymore and just want to move on with my life and be happy and not deal with any more psycho behavior. I'm just glad that I haven't received any messages from brother-in-law or my mom and that I have a great man. Thanks for all your comments. A lot of your comments made me and my boyfriend laugh. Story 4. My little sister thinks her period is so bad she needs a trip to the ER, and I'm just hoping our parents don't kill me for turning a period into a medical emergency while they're on vacation. Okay so I, 19 male, am babysitting my little sister, 15 female, while our parents are on a trip internationally. It's like a completely different time zone and the signal sucks, they get home in like 6 days. But we are both pretty self-sufficient and felt like it would be fine and my parents left us food and money and stuff. We've been Gucci for a whole week so far. Anyway this morning she got her period while we were just like sitting playing video games and she got blood all over the couch so I paused the game while she took care of it and put on a tampad and didn't make a big deal of it. I was trying to be nice because I know it can make girls cranky and it hurts and stuff, so I got snacks and a blanket and whatever and we kept playing. Well like maybe 40 minutes later she freaked out because she bled on the couch again and I'm like did you put the thing on wrong or what? So she changed again and I even helped her clean the blood off the couch this time and I figured she'd use a bigger feminine thing. No big deal. Well like 30 minutes after we start playing again she pauses and goes to the bathroom and I hear her scream so I run over there thinking there's a spider or something but she came out holding like this. Chunk. It was like a chunk of blood. But looking at it I'm like shit maybe that's an organ? Like is that your kidney? But she was like no it's a clot. And she was freaking out about it. Which yeah it was gross. It was like the size of a hacky sack. So I'm like okay well go flush your clot. Anyway she cleans herself up but then she said she doesn't want to play anymore and I'm like okay. So she spent an hour on the couch with her face all scrunched up doing yoga breathing and telling me her cramps were the worst ever, so I gave her Tylenol but she wouldn't take it because she said she feels like she's gonna throw up. I brought her water and juice and warmed up that gel thing you stick on your stomach you know? So I was trying to help. Well then she says oh no and she gets up and goes to the bathroom and as she's walking she's got like blood going down her leg. She yelled for me from the bathroom and I go in there and she's sitting there and I hear this plopping sound and there's more of those chunks. Like maybe two of them? And she says I think we need to go to the ER. I'm like why? And she tells me this is more blood than she's ever had and she doesn't feel good. But periods are supposed to suck right? And she wouldn't take the Tylenol either so she didn't really try to manage it at home. So then she started yelling at me telling me I have to take her because she can't drive but I'm pretty sure our parents will kill me if I take her to the ER for her period? Is that a thing? She's sitting in the shower now because she said she thought the warm water would feel good and she was sick of bleeding on stuff and it's more comfortable than the toilet. I asked her if she just needs a bigger tan pad and she told me to shut the F up so she's not even communicating with me at this point. I've asked her a few times if she's okay in there and she tells me I'm bleeding out Mason what do you think? So like she's not unconscious. I don't know, I don't know anything about this but I also know she hates blood and flips out about any minor cut too. Is going to the ER because of a period of thing? Can you bleed too much? I thought there was only a certain amount of blood in there every month. I feel like she'd be more comfortable at home anyway if she just took the Tylenol. I don't know what to do. My sister is like average teenage girl height, pretty skinny because she's a ballerina and doesn't eat meat. She takes a cutin for her pimples. I'm not sure if there's other stuff that's important. She's had her period for like a year now I'm pretty sure. Maybe more. She takes Flintstone gummy vitamins sometimes, like the ones in the purple jar. And she's obsessed with Celsius energy drinks. She wears contacts and she had her wisdom teeth removed two months ago. I don't know I want her to be okay and stuff but I'm not sure the ER is a good choice. Help? Relevant comments. Commenter, is there any chance of pregnancy or miscarriage? OP, I mean I don't think so. She doesn't have a boyfriend and when I asked she told me to fuck off so probably not. Commenter, tampons or pads? OP, I asked and she said she was using a tampon first but after that she used both to prevent leaks. So both I guess? She said always with wings and tampax sport. Commenter, a doctor, 
if she's saturating more than one tampon in an hour she should be seen. OP, she said she was soaking both of them so I guess we are going. Mini updates and comments 30 minutes later. OP, okay she's throwing some extra clothes and crap in a bag. I'm trying to think what my mom would do so I brought water bottles, sunscreen, and snacks. And something to do. Commenter, well, you don't need sunscreen at the hospital. Extra clothes. Maybe a water bottle. Snacks are good. Insurance card. And call your parents. Didn't they leave another adult's number for you to call in an emergency? Do you have another relative? OP, oh shoot yeah I gotta tell my parents. Crap. I mean no they didn't but I think it's because I'm the adult? Commenter, let this be a lesson to you, if a woman says this is wrong, this doesn't seem normal, about her own body, try listening to her and not making her jump through hoops convincing you something is wrong while you ask the internet for advice. Just listen to her. OP, yeah I was being a jerk. Multiple comments about the sunscreen, yeah lol I didn't think about the fact that it's inside, just like my mom always yelling about sunscreen. OP is encouraged to bring a comfort item for his sister, okay this makes me feel good because I packed her squishmallow and I was kind of afraid to tell her I did that in case she thought it was embarrassing or some. I sent my mom a text. One hour later, in response to someone telling him to bring a bowl in case she vomits, nah for real I wish I would have read this because she threw up in the car twice. She told me to stop driving like Stevie Wonder and I swear I was laughing so hard I almost had to pull over. Commenter, it sounds like she is really comfortable with you, I mean she let you help her clean up and showed you clots. And you didn't get all ew, I'm a guy don't show me. Frankly, you are acting better than my husband would when it comes to helping. He'd never look at my blood or think to bring snacks. So you are doing pretty good, and she might not feel she needs another female. OP, I mean if I acted grossed out she'd tell me to grow the heck up lol. My sister doesn't deal with stupid dudes. But yeah we're close and it's just blood so. About two hours after the OG post, okay we got here. She threw up a couple times in the car but she said she's good now. We walked in and she was like dripping down her leg again and they saw that at the desk and maybe how freaking freaked I looked lol, and took her back pretty much right away. Commenter, adding to this, because questions about her intimate history and habits are definitely going to be asked, big bro, make it clear to her that if she wants you to leave, you will. If she wants you to stay, I would make it clear to her that you're not going to snitch on her about anything she says. If it's something that needs to be brought up to your parents, the doctors can do that. It's not your job to tell your parents her answers. If you can't make her that promise, tell her you can't be in the room. OP, nah I'm not saying crap if I find anything out. She caught me smoking on the roof two years ago and still hasn't ratted lol. About one hour and ten minutes later, okay so she's getting Zofran and fluids and they're gonna do an ultrasound in the room here. So far we know she's not pregnant, and her labs some of them weren't great. Hemoglobin was 6.8, that's basically the only one I remember. She said to tell everyone thank you for the advice and stuff. She also said to say she feels okay, just really tired. About one hour, 20 minutes later, alright the ultrasound was normal. She's being admitted. They want to test her for bleeding and clotting disorders now, and they're going to give her some blood. They asked if I know my blood type which I don't but I'm not sure why it matters. Sister is B plus though. Commenter, you have properly unmouthed your foot, so don't be afraid to ask questions now. It's much better to ask questions so you don't have to worry or freak out about things you don't know or don't understand, than to drive yourself mad with worry about something that might not warrant that worry or leaves you with unanswered questions. Best of luck to you and your sis. Was she happy you packed her squishmallow? OP, yeah she's sleeping on the squishmallow like a pillow right now and told me it's the only reason she forgives me lol. That's a good idea though when she wakes up I'll ask her. Commenter, if she gets admitted, you may want to consider making a trip home to pick up any comfort items either of you two need, like a book, laptop, or blanket. But only if your sister feels comfortable with that. OP, so she packed clothes and I packed her squish mallow and our switches so we would have stuff to do. But she didn't even want me to get up to go pee so I don't think she wants me to leave lol. She's asleep now though. Commenter, definitely not the worst way to have to spend time in a hospital lol. Hope she turns out okay. Though I'm extremely curious about what the root cause is, and if you both feel comfortable sharing I'd love to know. OP, yeah she said she doesn't care as long as I don't post any pics of her because she said she looks like 2024 Amanda Bynes and Britney Spears combined lol. 7 hours later, we both slept. Got a hold of our parents, my mom is looking for flights back home. Sister is feeling a lot better at this point. They gave her medicine to stop the bleeding. I wasn't expecting this to blow up the way it did so there's no way I'll be able to answer everyone. She's doing okay though. Should know more about the CT soon. Commenter, mate I grew up with a crappy big brother and even now as adults I know he couldn't do half the job you've done of taking care of your little sister. You have restored my faith in humanity, and big brothers. Glad to see the night was uneventful and that you got hold of your parents. And whatever you do, don't forget to reapply your sunscreen often. OP, man, she changed my name in her phone to SPF I'm never living this shit down lol. 1.5 hours later, alright her vitals now are 101 over 65 and 80. So better. 6 hours later, CT was good too. They're pretty sure she has a blood disorder, they're just waiting on the results of it. I guess when she had her wisdom teeth out she bled more than she was supposed to but I didn't know that before. 
So yeah, just waiting on that for now but they don't think the issue is her uterus or whatever. 8 hours later, alright I'm gonna try here instead of a post and hopefully be more covert lol but could someone that knows about it tell me about type 2 von Wildebrads? Like the blood disorder? Because the internet says everything from like it's mild to it's life threatening and I guess I just wanna know more about it and like how it affects day to day life and stuff. I appreciate the help with my sister before too. It's cool you guys just do this. OP, yeah it got scary fast. It was crazy. But like no one has ever brought up taking her to the ER for it before so I don't know I thought maybe she was scared because our mom wasn't there to make her feel better and I don't know anything about it. First update the next day, alright so I guess I was posting updates in the comments but it's better here? Anyway so my sister is okay. She had some scans that were all fine and they don't think she has fibroids or tumors or anything like that. She's feeling a little better but still staying here at least another day. Our mom and dad are flying home tomorrow now. My mom was pissed I texted her instead of calling it first lol. Already had someone try to find me on Insta so like if you know me or her, no you don't lol. She doesn't want this going around school or whatever so don't dox us for at least 3 years. She's cool with me updating though without her name or whatever. Also our parents don't know about this either, I don't know I feel like we should wait until it's been a few years to tell them too so they don't kill me lol. She's gonna hold this shit over my head forever. Anyway they think she has a blood disorder that makes her not clot right. I'm not 100% sure how it works because she had big clots? but they said they're pretty sure that's what's going on because her PTT took longer than normal to clot. They're waiting on Von Wildebrand, SP? Testing to come back but they think she is type 2 probably. Gonna google that tonight because I don't know what that is and I've never heard of it so I guess if any of the doctors know what that is or if this sounds like it, let me know. Yeah I wasn't expecting this to blow up like this. I thought this was just like doctors answering questions like a helpline. But my sister said, thank you for everyone telling me to take her and she's okay. Second update later that same day. They confirmed it's Von Wildebrands, I don't know if I'll ever spell that right, anyway it's genetic I guess so they want me to get tested too but like obviously I've never had periods and I've never had surgery so it wouldn't be as obvious. There's still more testing I guess, like more specific to the type. But anyway sister is good and we have an answer. She's gonna talk to a hematologist next week about what that means and stuff. Third update one week later, so I guess I also have Von Wildebrands. So does our mom. I've always bruised a lot and got super bad nose bleeds but like I was also a dumb kid and teen who thought life was an audition for jackass so I didn't think it was weird lol. Anyway, we're all about to be real familiar with hematology and my mom is pissed she's been told some women just bleed more her whole life. I guess my mom and sister weren't just exaggerating when they would say they were bleeding out. So yeah I guess if you're a girl reading this and you bleed as much as my sister you should see a doctor. Hopefully no one gets gaslit like my mom did but yeah. Here's a public apology for being ignorant on what y'all actually go through because I thought you could only bleed so much a month. Fully willing to admit how freaking stupid that was lol. Another post later that day, hi so it's me again, 19m, apparently not that smart, questioning my career goals as a teacher. Anyway my sister was on her period and thought she needed to go to the ER and she actually did. I've got another question now but first, thank you to everyone who answered my first post and educated me bc she was in rough shape. Except for the girl who suggested drinking whole milk even I'm not that fucking stupid wtf? Anyway so my sister has Von Wilbrand's disease, type 2. My mom and I also have it apparently. My mom just got gaslit for years about how much she bled and it took my sister almost dying for us to all get diagnosed like what the heck. Anyway I play on a recreational rugby league. Gonna have to pay dues soon and I don't wanna be out the money if I'm gonna get told I shouldn't play anymore because it's a contact sport but I don't see a hematologist for 5 weeks since I'm not urgent lol. So was wondering if any of the doctors know if I'm gonna get told I probably shouldn't play rugby anymore? I also like rock climbing is that gonna be out? Should I learn chess or crochet or something? Lol. Thanks again. Relevant comments. Commenter. If you aren't confirmed yet. Don't play contact sports right now until at least you get testing. OP. Okay. Yeah it's confirmed I have it but I don't know the types and letter and stuff. But yeah I guess I'm gonna go learn how to play snooker then lol. Thanks. Commenter. I'm a lurker here because I'm not a doctor. But I am a teacher, and I do remember your post. Teaching is a lovely career, and the profession would benefit from someone as compassionate as you. OP. Lol one thing is for sure no students will get sunburned on my watch. Commenter. Thank you so much for this update. Not only is it interesting, but it furthers all of our professional knowledge base when we are able to hear how things turned out. Good luck to you and your family. And I'm glad that your mom's medical issues have finally been validated. That's huge. OP, oh yeah. I mean she's in her 40s, she'll kill me if I say exactly how old though lol, so like I can't believe she's been suffering for 30 something years. She said she's about to write a big I told you so to every doctor who ever told her to get used to it lol. Commenter, dead serious, no pun intended. You should take up comedy. The ones that are the funniest are the ones that don't understand how funny they are. I'm glad your sister is okay, and I hope you're good too. OP, oh yeah I'm totally good. Thanks man. Show this to my sister and she said tell them you're already insufferable as it is, the last thing you need is an audience. Savage. LOL. Commenter, you'll know more after your consultation.
there are different types of Von Willebrands, so what applies to your sister and your mom will not necessarily apply to you. I'm glad you guys got to the bottom of it, and I am extremely disheartened to hear that your mother was gaslit her entire life about her symptoms. There's not really an excuse from the medical community for that, and I'm sorry. OP, hey thanks. It's good to know it might not be the same. Honestly I'm surprised I made it this far without my brain bleeding because I was the poster child for ADHD lol. One more sunscreen comment, my dad's been calling me banana boat since they got back, crying face, rest in peace to any game I had lol. Commenter, trophy emoji, please accept this version of an award because there's no way I'm paying for them through here, but dude. The sunscreen. Story 5. My best friend granted her boyfriend permission to sleep with me behind my back, without ever asking if I was even interested, and I am having trouble explaining why I'm so upset over this. Okay so first and foremost, I'm not down to read any poly shaming. That's not the point of this post. Polyamory is a valid dating and relationship model when done ethically and I am laying that down first and foremost. So my best friend, Cindy, and I have known each other roughly 15 years and have been roommates for 5-ish years. Cindy is poly and has two partners, one that lives close by and one named Mark that lives in Oregon which is pretty far from us. I knew Mark through mutual friends prior to him meeting Cindy, and we actually slept together a couple times back in like 2016. He's poly and I am monogamous, and we decided it wouldn't work between us, but we maintain being good friends because we get along really well. I introduced those two in 2017, admittedly under the He's poly. You're poly. This poor attempt to match make, and they hit it off. In 2019, Mark had to move to Oregon for work, but they have been making it work via long distance and I am happy for them. So in 2020, I kinda lost my mind. I had to break up with a boyfriend who was in love with someone else, I realized I hated my job, I turned 30 and felt deeply unhappy with where my life was headed. So I decided it was best for me to start living. I quit my job, found a new one that made me happy, and I started to do solo hiking adventures. I mentioned in a group chat that I always wanted to camp in Crater Lake National Park in Oregon, and Mark offered his place for me to stay at and offered to be my hiking buddy, he's into hiking as well. Cindy hates camping, hiking in nature, but was excited for us to have fun and even helped me plan the trip, until two weeks ago. Out of nowhere, Cindy was as cold as ice to me. We take turns cooking, and suddenly on her nights to cook she would only make one portion and leave me nothing. She was short in conversation, didn't want to hang out with me in shared areas at all, and just seemed like she was pissed. I asked her if something was wrong, and she straight up ignored me. I went to mutual friends, who said they had no clue that something was wrong. Then yesterday, she invited me to a video chat with her and Mark. They told me they've discussed it, and I have permission to sleep with Mark on this trip. Apparently one of the boundaries in their relationships is neither of us can do anything with either of our partner's friends. Mark mentioned two weeks prior that he would be down to sleep with me on this trip if I was down for it, which led to fighting between the two. Mark argued that he already slept with me previously so I shouldn't count and Cindy was sternly on, she's my best friend so no. They reached an agreement, and were excited to tell me and I blew up at them. So many thoughts are swirling in my head right now and I cannot even verbalize all the reasons why I am mad. It's like my best friend and her boyfriend, someone I consider to be a good friend too, view me as an object in some ways but somehow worst. Sleeping with Mark wasn't even a concept to me as he is squarely in the best friend's boyfriend and good friend boxes in my mind. I logged off the chat, told Cindy I was too angry to look at her, and have been at a friend's place for the last day. I need advice on how to convey to them when I am so angry, when I am having trouble coming up with a reason besides blind rage. I barely want to go on this trip anymore. Comment from OP. I think where the shock and hurt is coming from is mostly the fact that I have been treated like freaking trash for the past two weeks in my own home for an issue that if anyone asked me, I could have ended with a quick, yeah no that's not going to happen. Mark is a good friend and while he was a fun intimate partner like five years ago, he is squarely my roommate's boyfriend in my mind and even with this permission, I wouldn't sleep with him. I am mad that Cindy treated me this way, I am frustrated at the apparent brainlessness on both their ends of not just talking to me. I'm annoyed that my intimate potential was discussed in depth by both of them. I'm kinda upset that a good friend may have only invited me to stay over at his place for the potential of banging me, and I'm pissed off that I am sleeping on a freaking futon like a 21 year old because even though Cindy was in the wrong, I left my apartment when she should have left. Ugh. I just have a lot going on emotionally at the moment. Mini update, okay, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who commented. Today has been rough for the most part but me and the friend whose futon I am occupying got tacos and I got to process this for the better part of my day. My feelings have landed mostly on being upset with Cindy. No matter what drama was going on in their relationship, I was treated like a pariah in my own goddamn home and that's unacceptable. The annoying part of this is now I am doubting whether or not I would have even considered sleeping with Mark if the situation came up organically. My friend who I am staying at, she's also Polly, I am one of the few mono people in my immediate friend group, hence why I was really harsh in my post about not accepting Polly hate because those are my people. My friend asked me how I would have preferred this situation playing out. My response was pretty much. 1. Cindy not taking out whatever she was feeling on me while they were having their backroom discussion. 2. 
being approached by one of them individually to see if I was interested in any of this and not in the weirdest freaking discord call in the world, she was in the room right next to me, she could have just came in and talked to me solo. If Mark would have asked me, I probably would have run to Cindy being like your boyfriend is hitting on me, I am unsure if that's even allowed. If Cindy would have, Christ on the freaking cross I am unsure how that would have even gone. Who knows, maybe with permission, and wine, and the breathtaking views of that lake, seriously ignore me and Google Crater Lake National Park, it's gorgeous, something would have happened. Nothing sure as hell is going to happen now though. This is a long-winded post to say that I am planning to talk to each of them one-on-one -on -one because at the end of the day, I already dropped like 450 bucks on round-trip tickets and I can't afford to stay anywhere else on short notice, I've looked into campsite lodge and nearby Airbnbs and hotels and everything is too expensive for me, and my PTO is already approved in my workbooks. I am not going to be awkwarded out of my vacation that I have dreamed about. I'm going to talk to them both and God help them if the first words out of their mouths isn't I'm sorry. Final update, hey, everyone. It's been just over three weeks since my last post and I wanted to post an update. I went home after two or three days, I can't actually remember how long I was gone now, when Cindy sent me a message saying she wanted to apologize. Apparently Cindy reached out to the mutual friend I was staying with, and that friend went over every cruel thing Cindy did to me during her two weeks of shutting me out and told her to get herself together. We sat down and talked and it was pretty illuminating what she had to say. Cindy and I have known each other for over 15 years now. For the majority of that time, I was the most more introverted and shy type while she was the, let's drink shots on the roof with this new friend I made 30 seconds ago type. When the plague hit, we both had two very different responses. After realizing I was deeply unhappy with all parts of my life, I flipped everything on its head. I found a new job and made a bunch of work friends. I started doing solo adventures. I felt happier than I ever been, and it turns out, happy me is very bubbly and engaging. While I couldn't go out for obvious reasons, I started actually using Discord and engaging more with friends and going on virtual dates. Cindy did the opposite. Her job went work from home pretty early on which cut her off from most of her work friends, and she lost an aunt she was close to due to the virus. Cindy works customer service at an online store, so after 8 hours on the phone in front of a computer, she doesn't want to Zoom or Discord or message anyone from the exhaustion of it all. Cindy admitted that she felt like she was falling apart meanwhile the person she grew up with was doing better than ever. Cindy is not one to express her feelings, she comes from an army what's a feeling family, she apparently she decided that best course of action was bury everything in her chest and do nothing about it. Then Mark asked if he could sleep with me and everything started leaking out. Cindy admitted that rule, neither of us can do anything with either of our partner's friends, is a bit more flexible than I originally thought and is more of a, please ask if I am cool with this before you flirt with my friend's situation. Apparently Cindy was cool with the concept of us sleeping together previously. Back in 2019, I was planning a trip to Seattle for the summer of 2020. Mark offered to join me and we were planning on splitting a two-bedroom Airbnb. It didn't happen for obvious reasons, but apparently Mark asked Cindy during the planning stage if he could even broach the topic with me and if he was cool with it. Mark, going off how she was previously cool with it, checked in again with her before he was planning on talking to me about it for the most recent trip, and that's when the blow-up happened. Cindy apologized for how she treated me the past two weeks and admitted that she felt like she was failing at everything in her day-to-day -day life and then felt like she was going to lose her boyfriend to me if something happened between us. I honestly feel like a crappy friend in some sense, because while I knew her depression was flaring up again, I didn't quite realize how deep she was in it despite living together. I did stand my ground on the fact that while her feelings are valid, the way she treated me wasn't and that type of behavior cannot happen again. She agreed and even invited me to sit in on a session with her therapist, she was already going to cope with the feelings in regards to her very messy family, which I said I would, after she had more solo time to process it. I did end up going on the trip. Mark apologized for blowing up my home with his question, and we had a conversation about how while he is sweet, I really don't see any future where I sleep with him again. He was cool with it and said he was excited to have a good friend come up for nature adventures. I just got home yesterday from my adventures and have been sharing the photos with Cindy for the better part of the day. She thinks the shots are beautiful and her biggest concern is that I could have hurt my lungs since it was pretty smoky out there on one of the days I was out there due to wildfires in Cali. So, that's basically it. Thanks for all your comments. Story 6. I'm rethinking having kids with my wife now that I know her dad's past, but apparently, she's more concerned about making him a grandpa than keeping our future kids safe. My wife Jessica, 32 female, and I, 30 male, have been married for two years, and we've been trying to start a family. Jessica has an older sister, Mary, but they're not close at all. She told me they had a big falling out over some family drama, and since then, they just don't speak anymore. I've asked about it a few times, curious to know what really happened, but Jessica always brushes it off saying she doesn't like talking about it and that it's not something worth digging into. Well, it was Jessica's brother's birthday yesterday and we were all over at his house to celebrate. Mary made an appearance and there was a lot of drama. Long story short, she called Jessica and her brothers out for still associating with their dad when they know that he is a child molester. No one was paying her any mind and I was really confused on what the hell was going on. When Mary left and Jessica and I went home, I asked Jessica what the hell happened. 
She said that when they were kids, Mary used to claim that their dad used to touch her. I asked if it's true and Jessica was stuttering a lot. She said she knows her dad used to do bad things but that Mary cut them all off when she turned 18 and moved out. I asked if she is admitting that she knows her dad was a child molester and did things to his own daughter. She said he doesn't do it anymore and he was just in a really bad place in his life, and he apologized to Mary so there's nothing else anyone can do for Mary. I was honestly appalled. I also feel so terrible for Mary. Jessica made it seem like Mary did something wrong and deserved to be basically exiled from the family. I could have never imagined that this is what happened. I asked if she expects me to now be willing to have that man around our future children and she started shouting at me, saying I'm judging him off something that happened two decades ago and whether I like it or not, he is going to be our child's grandpa and he will be in their lives. I said if she insists on it, I think we need to hold off on having kids and have serious conversations about it. She's extremely angry at me but I don't know how I could better react to be honest. This feels like a huge deal that she is minimizing. I'm not crazy for thinking this way, right? Update one year later, hello. It's been nearly a year since my post so I thought I would give an update. A few days after my original post, I sat Jessica down and told her how I was feeling. I told her I'm not okay with what she and her family had done to Mary. They knew what their dad had done to her but still chose to take his side and make Mary look crazy. I told her I'm also not okay with brushing her father's crimes under the rug. She was quiet and didn't say anything. She didn't try to defend herself or her family. She was just staring at me in a very chilling way. Almost like she was indifferent to whatever I had to say and just wanted it to be over. I told her I needed time to myself and I would leave and think about what I wanted to do. Suddenly she was paying attention. She seemed shocked and panicked. She started begging me not to leave, saying I'll get over it in a few days when we get back to how we usually are and things settle down. She said all families have skeletons in their closet and that this can't define our marriage. I said no and I left the house for a few days. I ignored all her calls and those of her family. I reached out to Mary on Facebook. I wrote her a lengthy message about how I had no idea all she had been through, and that I'm so sorry for how her family treated her. I told her to reach out to me if she ever needs anything. She got back to me and asked if we can meet for coffee. We met up the day after. At first it was small talk, then she asked if I would be okay if she told me her version of events. I said of course I would, and she spoke to me about it. Everything her dad did and how her family treated her after she told them. I felt physically sick. She even told me stories about how Jessica told her friends that Mary has a mental condition that causes hallucinations, and that just in case Mary starts rumors about their family, that's why. A lot of people still believe Mary has a mental condition because of my wife. I knew after that talk that I had to end things with Jessica. I went over to our house and told her I want a divorce. I told her I cannot stand the thought of being her husband and a part of their disgusting family. All she did was cry and ask all this for her? I knew then that she hadn't changed. She was still the same person that did all of those things to Mary, and she was still doing them. We're still not officially divorced but we haven't been together since, and we are going through the process. It's just taking longer than I thought to get it finalized. Mary and I became friends. I invited her to a birthday dinner my family were hosting for me, and she hit it off with my cousin. He's crazy about her, and she seems really happy with him too. He keeps asking me if it would be too early to propose and I have to tell him to not scare her away lol. But they have a really wholesome relationship and I'm really happy for them. As for me, I'm just surviving. Divorces are tough, but I know I made the right choice. Thank you to everyone that responded and gave me advice. I really appreciate it. Story 7. I kicked my brother and his wife out over a joke she made about my kids and my late wife, and now half the family thinks I'm the bad guy, but I don't regret it at all. I, 36 male, am a single father to my two kids, who will call Gabriel, 17 male, and Becky, 14 female. Their mother, my wife, passed away 8 years ago after a long illness. Obviously, this was devastating for our family and we're still recovering from the loss even now. I haven't remarried or even bothered seriously dating since my wife's death, as I don't think I'll ever love anyone like I did her ever again. I miss her dearly, but I am content being single if she's not around. Also relevant to this post, the house that we live in currently originally belonged to my wife's grandfather. She inherited it when he passed, and then she left it to me in her will. It's a nice house and quite large, with five bedrooms and a decent amount of land as well. I have a younger half-brother, who will call James, 30 male. James and I share a father but have different mothers. To be honest, we've never been particularly close. Not to get too into irrelevant details, but our upbringings and our respective relationships with our father are very different, and it's always been a source of quite a lot of tension between the two of us. However, at the end of last year, James suffered from a series of pretty severe misfortunes. The company that he was working for went under, meaning that he ended up losing his job and, since he works in quite a specialized and competitive field where jobs are few and far between in the first place, he was having a really difficult time finding another one. He was the sole earner for his family, so obviously this was quite a blow for them. Several weeks after that, they experienced a house fire which left the family homeless and destroyed a lot of their belongings. Despite not being close at all, I obviously didn't want to see my family suffer in this way, and since I had the room to do so, I offered for James and his family to come and stay at my home until they were able to get back on their feet. This meant that, living in our house was as follows, myself, my two kids, James, his wife Laura, 31 female, and their twins Abby and Sarah, both 9 female. 
It became apparent very shortly after they moved in that we have very different lifestyles and perspectives on things. Simply put, James and Laura consider themselves to be more of a traditional couple, which is why James was the sole earner for their household. They both believe that it is a man's duty to go out and work while his wife stays at home and tends to the house and the children. This is also how they are raising their daughters. Let me be clear if they want to live this way and it works for them, then power to them and they're well within their rights to do so. However, this isn't how I run my own household. Both of my kids have always been taught how to do housework, and both have always been actively encouraged to pursue whatever careers they want in the future. I was aware of our lifestyle differences before they moved in. However, I had not been anticipating it becoming an issue of any sort. However, around a month into them living with us, I noticed that James and Laura were starting to try and push their ways into my family. For example, on nights when it was Gabriel's turn to do the dishes, Laura would tell him he shouldn't be doing that and would ask one of her own daughters to do it, or suggest Becky take over instead. I also noticed that James developed a habit of asking Becky to do things for him that he was perfectly capable of doing himself, such as getting him a drink while everyone was watching TV together or asking her to clean up a mess that he made. I always shut this behavior down when it happened, and eventually sat James and Laura down one night and told them that they're perfectly welcome to live how they want when they have their own home, but this is the way we do things in my house and I would appreciate if they would stick to that while under my roof. They did try to push back a little, but I held firm and they eventually relented. For the next few months, everything seemed fine. There were a couple of instances where Gabriel and James knocked heads over differences of opinions, but it was never anything serious and never went any further than a couple of heated discussions over the breakfast table. I was also aware that Becky found Abby and Sarah a bit annoying because they always wanted to be in her room or around her but again, this was nothing major and was very typical teenager sharing a house with younger kids type of stuff. In late July of this year, James finally found another job in his field and they began the process of finding a new home of their own. All seemed great. However, around this same time, I noticed that there was a sort of shift in energy between Gabriel and Laura. He seemed suddenly to be quite uncomfortable around her, never wanted to be alone with her and avoided talking to her in group settings. This immediately struck me as odd because he's usually a very laid-back and friendly kid, so I asked him what was up and if anything had happened. At first he said that nothing had, and that she was just being that way she is and it was getting on his nerves. By this I assumed he just meant that she'd start pushing this idea that, as a man, he shouldn't be doing domestic labor of any kind on him again. I contemplated saying something at the time, but decided to leave it as I knew they'd be moving out soon and it wouldn't be a problem anymore. Fast forward a few weeks, James, Laura and their kids are out for the day. My daughter approaches me and says she has something important to tell me that might make me upset. I asked what was up, and she told me that Laura had told her that the reason I haven't remarried or gotten a new girlfriend yet is because women my age don't want to settle for someone who isn't a real man and had made a joke that my wife was probably having an affair before she died anyway. Becky also said that Laura told her I was jealous of my brother because he earned everything he had while this house was just a handout. Note, aside from inheriting the house, I have also worked for everything I have ever had, and that she feels sorry for Gabriel because I'm going to turn him into a pussy like me. Obviously, I was already furious at this alone but I wanted to also speak to my son before I took anything further to find out if anything had been said to him as well. When I asked him, I found out that Laura had not only made the same jokes to him, but had offered to hire a street worker for his 18th birthday so that he could become a man. Gabriel isn't into girls, and when he told her that she had just laughed it off and told him he'll learn to be. When James and Laura returned to the house, I immediately confronted her about this. She didn't deny any of it, but just started laughing and saying it was all a joke and I needed to lighten up. I told her that, not only did I not find it funny but she was no longer welcome in my house if that's how she was going to speak to my children, and that I wanted either an earnest apology or for her to leave that night. They were both outraged at this, continuously telling me to lighten up and get a sense of humor. I told them it wasn't funny at all and gave them the same ultimatum, apologize and mean it, or Laura has to leave. I made it clear that she was the one I had the issue with and that James and their twins could stay if they wanted, but I didn't want her in my house anymore if that's what she felt was appropriate. That night, they packed their stuff up and the whole family went to an Airbnb, where they stayed for a couple of weeks until they were able to move into a new place. Our family have been split on this. Our father is taking James's side, which isn't shocking at all lol, though surprisingly James's mother has reached out to me and acknowledged that what Laura said was inappropriate and she understands why I'm upset, though she thinks I overreacted. The two of them have been very much dramatizing the story about how I threw them out in the middle of the night for no reason, they left at around 7pm and went straight to the Airbnb, so in a lot of their friends' eyes, I'm the villain in this scenario. I know I did what was right for me and my children, but I am catching an awful lot of flack for it and it is starting to take a bit of a toll. Mostly, I just can't wait for it to be over. Thank you for letting me vent about this all, it felt good to get a lot of it off my chest. Story 8 I met an amazing guy on a dating app, and now I'm wondering if I should drop the I was born without the usual lady parts bomb on our first date, or let him crush on me a little longer before I scare him off. So, I have MRKH syndrome. Basically this means I was born without a vagina, vaginal canal, cervix, uterus, and fallopian tubes. This makes it so I am unable to make love and unable to have children. I met a guy on a dating app about a week ago and we've been texting ever since. I've been super busy with school, volunteer work, and meetings, so we haven't actually met in person yet. We spoke on the phone once so far while he was walking home from work at 3 a.m., he's a bartender. 
He's really funny, and I feel like he gets me. We've set up a coffee date for Wednesday and I'm really looking forward to it. So far, he's definitely shown interest in me, saying things like how he's been crushing on me or how he thinks I'm really sweet and lovely. I don't want to get ahead of myself but I feel the same way back. This is the first time I've ever connected with someone this way on a dating app. I'm excited but at the same time I'm also very nervous. He's very honest and blunt about things and I feel that I need to reciprocate that. A lot of doctors and therapists say that there's no right time to discuss it, only when you feel comfortable. Although that's true, I don't want either of us to be invested in the other before having the chance to talk about it. So I guess my question is how long should I wait before telling him? Would it be too much if I told him on our first date? I mean, for all I know maybe he won't even be interested in me after we meet in person. But at the same time if he is, I'm not trying to scare him away. And a follow-up question, how do I begin to tell him? Maybe a funny way to approach it? Or a good conversation starter that could lead the conversation towards my condition? I've told one guy before and that didn't go too well. I waited a month to tell him and I ended up crying while doing it. He was interested in me before I told him but afterwards, he was only interested in being friends with benefits. My self-esteem definitely took a kick with that one. First update 5 days later, I apologized for the length of this, but I suppose I needed something for me to lay out what happened and come to terms with it myself. In short, it went terrible. And frankly, I didn't handle it well. The original plan was to get coffee, see how the date went and go on from there. He told me he had been recently fat fished, not sure if that is the correct term but he had previously met up with a girl who was way heavier than what was presented in her dating profile, and it allegedly went poorly. He was texting me less and less leading up to the day we planned on meeting, last Wednesday. He texted me Tuesday morning saying that he was sick, and apologized for the lack of communication. I had classes that day and was only able to get back to him later in the evening. I asked him if he was busy because I wanted to call him, see how he was feeling, and figure out what the plan was. I told him that health comes first, and we can always reschedule, but he insisted how badly he wanted to see me. Somehow he convinced me to see him Tuesday, at his place, even though he was sick. Once I got to his place, he was extremely sweet and nice. We totally hit it off, he complimented me a lot, said I was cute and hugged me, twice, all excitedly like when a puppy sees you when you get home after a long day. He made us coffee, and we talked about life, school, family, hobbies and interests etc. It was going very well. We got into the discussion of movies and TV shows, and he ended up turning on his TV, and switched to Netflix. I asked him if he watched any anime. Personally, I'm not big on anime but I've seen a few shows because my younger brother is into it. I recommended Full Metal Alchemist to him and we started watching that. He asked if he could sit closer to me, I said yes, and he noticed I was cold, so he turned up the heat and brought out a blanket for us. I had my head resting on his chest with his arm around me, and I joked about how fast his heart was beating. He said that it was probably because he had a cute girl sitting with him. In that moment, I realized I had to tell him about my condition. It took a while for me to get into that discussion because one, I just wanted to hold on to that moment for a bit longer and two. I wanted to tell him, but I couldn't get the words to come out. He looked at me and tried going in for a kiss, but I pulled away. I said that I had to tell him something and asked him to turn off the TV. He obliged. I just froze after that. I literally couldn't get the words to come out in the way I wanted them to or how to begin to talk coherently. Even though I asked for advice in the previous post, I totally went blank in that moment, and none of it was implemented effectively. I tried changing the conversation because I felt like I was going to cry but he assured me that I could tell him. I honestly don't remember what I said because I'm pretty sure my brain shut down, but I managed to mumble some sort of god-awful explanation. He asked a few questions, and then said he wasn't sure if he could be in a relationship that doesn't involve lovemaking. He said that we could keep it casual for now and see where things went. Even though I originally went in with the worst expectation, I was still hurt by what he said. I felt really let down because he met a lot of the things on my checklist, and I thought we connected well. I asked what keep it casual specifically meant for him, and he said that we could be exclusive, but he didn't want to get too emotionally attached. I guess that was the part that really stung. I told him that I wasn't looking for a definitive answer yet because it was still too early to tell anything, and I wasn't looking for marriage, but if he knew right now, for a fact, that he can't be in a serious relationship with someone that has my condition then I wasn't interested. I know myself too well and honest to God I can't get involved with someone without getting emotionally attached, and agreeing to see where it went would be intentionally setting myself up to get hurt. Plus, I think that was just his way of saying no to me nicely. He politely said that we could both take a few days to think about what we wanted, and he'd let me know. He was just trying to let me down easy, because we both knew what he meant. It was around 8.30 p.m. by the time we got done with that discussion and I said that I should probably leave. He walked me to the elevator, in silence, and as I was about to enter the elevator he asked if I would still be interested in being friends because he enjoyed my company. I said I wasn't sure, and that I'd talk to him later. By the time I got down to the first floor and out the building, I had tears down my face, and I felt like absolute crap. Pretty much every guy I have told about my condition would later go on to say that we could be friends with benefits or something more friendly. I just felt like no one would ever want me for me, and that all I would be good for is some side action. I felt really alone. 
I felt that the only reason I had ever been in a relationship previously was because I hadn't been diagnosed with my condition when I started dating my ex, and we had already been together for a year when I did find out. I felt like he only stayed with me a year longer because we had a strong emotional bond, but even that came to an end when he cheated on me. I'm not that insecure but at that time I couldn't think straight. I had just experienced something nice, and it was instantly taken away from me. I haven't had many friends after my ex cheated on me with my best friend and I cut contact with everyone in that circle and making friends at university is difficult if you're a commuter. I ended up calling a guy I know as I walked back to the subway. I don't really consider him a friend anymore because he has told me he has feelings for me, but I don't feel the same way back towards him, and he makes constant cheesy statements about me and him despite me telling him not to. I don't want him getting too attached to me, so I keep my distance. But in that moment, I really needed someone, and I didn't have any other option. So I called him, he picked up, I asked if he was busy, and he said he was playing a game with friends and he could call me back later. I didn't want to bother him like that, so I told him it wasn't necessary. So, I did something very stupid, and called my ex. His girlfriend, the girl he cheated on me with, had him block my number, so it went straight to voicemail. Like any insane person, I left a very pathetic voicemail, sobbing and all. I said I didn't have anyone to talk to and apologized for calling him, but I couldn't think of anyone else to talk to. I didn't mention what happened or anything, just that I needed someone. I stood outside in the cold, it's snowing here, for a while until my whole body felt numb. I gathered myself and thought come on, what the heck are you doing? This is not you. You're better than this. I promptly got on the subway, went home, got into bed, and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning with a fever, that's what I get for getting too close to a guy that's sick, but still had to go to class and attend tutorials. I thought about my reaction a lot, and how poorly I had handled it. Clearly, I have issues I need to work on. I stayed late after the tutorial getting extra help, and after my TA was done helping all the other students, I went to her office and privately asked her if she had any recommendations for someone that I could talk to on campus. She asked me if it had to do with academic stress or something more personal. I said the latter. She pulled out her laptop so quick and got me numbers, emails, and addresses for places I could contact on campus. She told me that she understood and that she too was having issues a couple months ago and recommended a clinic she had been to personally. I couldn't stop thanking her. Before I left, I said, it's not a big deal or too serious, I guess things could always be worse and without skipping a beat, she said yeah, but things could also be a lot better. I thanked her for her help and left. He hasn't texted me in two days now. I'll wait a little longer, but I guess I got my answer. I realize I am not ready for dating. For the time being, I should get help. It's not that I can't handle rejection, but the fact that time and time again, I get guys who are totally into me, and aren't looking for love making right away because they want something more meaningful, but as soon as I mention no love making at all, for now, at least, they turn me down. If they rejected me right from the start, and we didn't get along well, I could handle that perfectly fine. I can't help but think I'm a defective human, and will never find a guy who would appreciate me for me. I have yet contact the number my TA gave me. If you've read this far, thank you. If you have any advice, things I should improve on, better ways to handle situations like this, constructive criticism, or any other comments, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Final post two more days later, I just wanted to address some common questions, and to clear up some things I've mentioned in the comments briefly. I hope this post is a little more coherent and organized than my previous ones. But before I do that, I really just want to thank everyone for all your nice messages and advice, you have no idea how much it actually means to me, and how much I appreciate it. Quick update, I texted Kyle yesterday and he replied. I asked him how he was feeling. He said he was even more sick than earlier. I said I was too, and I said it was his fault, in a joking way, because it was just as much my fault too. I told him about how I had a volunteer thing at university which I went to and how I nearly fainted because of my fever and ended up coming home early. But that was it. We didn't talk about much else because he stopped responding. In addition to this, I haven't called the number my TA gave me because they are only open Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So, I'm going to be doing that on Monday, hopefully. My condition, the exact name for my condition is Meyer Rokotonsky Kuster Hauser Syndrome, or MRKH Syndrome for short. It affects one in every 5,000 women. A lot of people, I'm assuming they were trolls, stated that I was a guy or something along those lines. Just to clarify, I am a woman, I look like a woman physically and I felt like a woman my whole life. I was genetically born with 20 chromosomes. Being a woman is not something I doubt. There are basically two types of branches within MRKH. Type 1 is an isolated occurrence, meaning there is only a lack or underdevelopment of internal reproductive organs. Type 2 is more serious as it is also associated with auditory, vertebral, renal, and cardiac issues. This may include hearing loss, bent or curved spine, missing kidney, etc. I have type 1. There are a lot of variations for each woman and to what extent they are affected by this. I am mainly going to be talking about my individual case. Diagnosis, a lot of people were confused as to why I was only diagnosed with this a year ago and not at birth, and why did I find out after already being with my ex for over a year. 
The way MKRH works is that it affects internal reproductive organs. This means that just by looking on the outside, it is undetectable. From the outside, I look like a normal female. I have normal external genitalia, including a clitoris, urethra, labia, etc. I am missing the vaginal opening, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and my ovaries are underdeveloped. My ovaries contain a few eggs, and they function enough to produce lower levels of estrogen, which is why I am still physically able to look like a female. For me personally, instead of a vaginal opening, I have something called an indentation or dimple. For 18 years of my life, I lived thinking I was just like any other girl. I never once suspected anything was wrong. When I started dating my ex, we never attempted to make love because neither of us were ready. But this was around the time I started to feel like something was wrong. One main reason was that I hadn't started my period, and the second being the fact that I wasn't able to insert a finger inside myself. For some reason, at the time, I assumed periods and fingering went together. I thought that once a girl got her period, her privates opened and the barrier fell out or something like that. It's weird looking back at that now haha. I went to the doctors one day, this was before I started dating my ex, with my mom after she started getting worried about me not getting my period. This is probably one of the most common ways women with MRKH find out about it. The doctors simply assumed that I was a late bloomer and told me to fix up my diet and workout. I was underweight at the time, around 82 pounds with a height of 5 feet. I was referred to a pediatrician who did absolute jack about my situation. The following year, I got my crap together on my own. I joined the wrestling team, track team, and I started doing weight training. As a result of this, I was also eating way more, and I gained a lot of muscle mass. I got my weight up to 120 pounds when I still hadn't gotten my period, I went back to the doctors. They still didn't take it too seriously, telling me that some women don't get their periods until they turn 20 or something, or ask me about my family history. I had multiple blood tests done, showing my levels were completely normal. I didn't feel like everything was normal, so I switched around doctors, seeing different specialists, and pediatricians, getting more and more blood tests done each time. Needless to say, I was getting tired of blood tests because I knew they didn't show anything. One doctor said my prolactin levels were too high, but I think that was circumstantial. Prolactin is the hormone that produces breast milk in pregnant women, and she kept insisting that I had breast discharge which is something I had never experienced before in my life. Somehow, I can't exactly remember which doctor, I ended up getting put on birth control pills as an attempt to reset my biological functions and induce a period. I diligently took the birth control pills every day. Nothing happened. This is when I thought, is it just me or does healthcare in Canada suck? Then another doctor suggested I get a pelvic ultrasound done. This is when they found the issue. The poor lady who did my ultrasound spent over an hour looking for my uterus which didn't even exist. The doctor did a pretty terrible job of telling me the news, in all honesty. She stood at the door, ultrasound reading in hand, with the door wide open, and told my mom I had MRKH. She said according to the ultrasound I had an underdeveloped uterus, this ends up being false later. She literally didn't even spend two minutes talking about it and left. I walked back to the car with my mom, she was crying as she called my dad and told him the news. His response was just to start swearing, not knowing he was on speakerphone and I could hear him. And then he said, it's okay, just forget it. I came home, and I did some googling and started to learn more about MRKH. I had already been with my ex for over a year up till this point, and I texted him while he was at work, and told him about it. I also added that if it changed anything between us, that I would understand, and I wouldn't hold it against him. As much as I might hate him now, he was the only one who ever handled this news properly, which is something I really needed at the time. After the initial news, my doctor handed my file over to a sick kids hospital in downtown Toronto as they were better acquitted to handle cases like mine. They started off by wanting to get everything straight with what they knew about my condition. They had me get an MRI done because, although ultrasounds are more inexpensive, they are not as clear and detailed as an MRI. I also had an ear exam, x-rays of my spine, and another pelvic ultrasound, to check kidneys. Doctors aren't allowed to disclose patient information and of course, the poor lady spent a good while looking for my uterus and even called in another technician to help. I ended up asking them if they were trying to look for my uterus, because I didn't have one. The look on their face was hilarious as I'm sure they probably never heard of my condition either. After I met up with my doctor, and everything was figured out, I was properly informed that I did not have any issues with my spine, or kidneys, or ears, but I was missing a uterus, cervix, vaginal canal, and fallopian tubes. I was called in for another appointment after a couple weeks and they did a physical examination where they wanted to measure the depth of my vagina. They had me lay down with my legs in the stirrups, and they took a q-tip covered in a lubricant gel and inserted it in me. The depth of it was about 3 millimeters deep. It was actually quite painful, and I hated doctors by this point anyways. Family situation, my parents are pretty religious, and discussions about topics about the female body, menstruation, and private matters like that are highly taboo. Everyone knows about it, but no one talks about it. My mother isn't educated and she doesn't know English well so most of the time when I went to the doctors, I went with my dad. It was very weird and awkward. 
The few times my dad refused to go with me, I went with my mom and had to translate everything the doctors were saying for her. After my last appointment with Sick Kids Hospital, they referred me to a social worker who gave me her business card, some brochures and other things with information about my condition. My dad took those from me and threw them out, saying I didn't need them. They also asked if I would like to attend the support group meetings they had weekly at the hospital to which my dad also insisted that I didn't it. Going to therapy at the hospital in secret isn't an option because it's too far. I can't drive on the highway yet, and it would be impossible for me to make up some lie to go. Taking the bus there would take over two hours, which I don't particularly mind doing if it helps me, but I don't have time due to school. I actually got a letter from the hospital in September about a pretty cool MRKH conference here where different doctors came with information and everyone dealing with it was invited. I really really wanted to go. But again, it was far. I figured since it was a once in a lifetime opportunity, I could definitely bus there. The event started at 8 a.m. and busing literally took five hours. It was unrealistic for me to go. So then I told my parents about it and they said you don't want to go to that. They'll put all sorts of rubbish in your mind and now you're not really a woman. I tried arguing that it was exactly the opposite of that, and that they want to inform you that you are a woman despite the lack of certain organs. They responded by taking away the letter, which had a website address on it, I had received from the hospital and throwing it away. I had someone telling me that I need to stand up to my parents. My parents aren't the issue, but my dad is. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances that I don't particularly want to reveal online, standing up to him jeopardizes everything for my mother and my younger siblings which is something I refuse to do. I am well aware of the crappy situation I am in. I know they are being abusive, in more than one way. I've thought long and hard about it, and I've come to the terms that not doing anything about it is the best approach. I'm not saying this out of fear or wanting to be selfish and pretending like we're a normal family. I've seriously taken everyone's well-being and the future of my younger siblings into consideration, and unfortunately, this is the best option for now. Surgery, I had a lot of people asking or informing me about surgery. In my first post, somewhere in the comments, I believe I said something along the lines of I'm a broke college student, and surgery isn't an option right now, as a way to avoid talking about the real reason why I can't get surgery yet. Lucky for me, I live in Canada and I have health insurance. Surgery is definitely an option for me. But due to my family situation, they believe that I won't need surgery until after I get married because I mean it's not like I'm going to be making love anytime soon. Haha. <laughs> Additional comments. 1. A lot of people, mainly guys, are saying that I could look into doing butt stuff. It's all about personal preference, and I hate it. It's not hot, it's not fun, it's literally feeling like reverse pooing and it's not a good feeling. 2. I can look into the asexual community, but I am not asexual. I may not be able to satisfy my needs, but I do have a pretty high intimate drive, and I do enjoy giving and other sexual activities. I don't know if I would want to be in a relationship with an individual who does not want that. 3. A lot of people had a lot to say about how I handled the situation. Some saying I did the right thing, and others saying I did it too soon. Honestly, I haven't figured out the right way to go about it. I have experimented with telling on first date, telling after a couple dates, telling before we even meet up, and none of them have gone well at all. I once told a guy about my condition before we met up, and the first thing he said to me when he saw me was aren't you surprised I still agreed to meet up with you after what you told me? I was so taken aback by it, I didn't even know how to respond to such an insensitive and arrogant comment. Someone said that if a dude has irritable bowel syndrome, I'm sure it's an important part of their life but it's a huge first date turn off. So he shouldn't disclose it on the first date. True, but it's not like them screwing is going to be affected by his IBS. I didn't disclose it because it was an important aspect of my life but because it was relevant to what was happening. I evaluated the situation I was in with Kyle and noticed that he was trying to get to the next level, so I had to tell him. Agree or not, first date material or not, I'm going to stand by with what I did because in that moment it was the right thing to do. 4. I am not going to disclose this on my dating profile. It's easy for everyone to sit there and suggest I do that, but you don't really know what it's like until you're actually in the situation yourself. I don't want to publicly display it to guys I'm not interested in, nor to those who aren't interested in me. I know guys who also use those dating apps, and I don't want them to stumble across my profile and find out about it. 5. The guy I ended up calling on Tuesday night, after I left Kyle's apartment, he knows about my condition. He has told me that it wouldn't bother him. I had a lot of messages telling me that I shouldn't friendzone him, and that I should give him a chance. Here is the real reason why I'm not attracted to him nor why I would never ever give him a chance, he's basically doing nothing with his life. He's 24, lives with his mom, doesn't work, can't drive, plays video games all day, uses his depression and anxiety as an excuse from putting in any effort towards having an independent life. Whereas I on the other hand, I work part-time, I study my butt off in school, and I make time to do extracurricular stuff. I also deal with depression, self-harm, and self-destructive thoughts. But I treat each day as an opportunity to make progress. I'm not saying I'm better than him because our circumstances are very different nor am I saying that he's not trying his best because everyone deals with things differently. I'm just saying he doesn't have his crap figured out yet and I'm not into that. In addition to this, he was once involved in a situation where he was the other guy. 
He was involved with a girl who had a boyfriend and he knew this before getting involved with her but continued with it anyway because he was lonely. I was on the opposite end of that kind of situation, and even though he might not be aware of the magnitude of his actions, I am. There is no way I am dating someone who selfishly puts their needs first and is able to convince themselves that cheating is somehow okay. 6. I think one of the main reasons I even turned to Reddit in the first place was because I am clearly looking for some sort of support because therapy isn't an option for me. Social media platforms for support do exist, but my parents had me added or followed on those, and I don't want them finding out. This is far longer than it needed to be, sorry. I hope I answered some questions. I really do appreciate all the support I got. Thank you, and take care everyone. Edit 1, I'm only doing this to feel better about myself, Kyle finally replied to me and said. I definitely do not want to get involved. Fuck you, Kyle. If y'all want to hate on him, feel free to. I welcome it with open arms. Edit 2, I think I forgot to address this earlier. For those of you asking whether I can orgasm through clitoral stimulation, the answer is no. My clitoris is underdeveloped. Stimulation feels good, but it's not enough to reach orgasm. Maybe a stronger vibrator or something like that would work? I don't know. I haven't tried. Edit 3, guys. I, can, still, pee. I have a urethra. You do not put a guy's pee pee in the same place you pee from. Simply anatomy. Story 9. I proposed to my girlfriend and out of nowhere, she thought it was finally time to introduce me to her secret inner circle of friends, and now I'm already thinking about ditching this relationship. I, 32 male, just recently proposed to my girlfriend Sharon, 30 female, of two years, like a month and a half ago, and it feels like the second the ring got on her finger, her attitude and behavior took a total 180. The entire time we were dating, we seemed exceptionally compatible, and at least it seemed we shared common beliefs and morals. Seven weeks ago, I proposed and she said yes and I felt like it was the happiest moment for the two of us. But not even a week later, it's like her attitude totally flipped. I thought I knew all her friends, but one day I came home and there were six women I've never seen before, and Sharon introduced me to them. I was curious as to why I was just now meeting them, when I already met Sharon's two best friends, Michelle and Octavia, both not present, over a year and a half ago. Sharon said she wanted to make sure we were a sure thing before I met her inner circle. I found this strange, not to mention it was a weeknight and they were quickly draining my wine rack of wine. Sharon still had her own place, but she stayed with me so often that she practically lives here. I still found it really rude when they left, leaving behind four empty bottles. I tried to discuss with Sharon about having uninvited guests on weeknights, but she brushed off my concerns very casually. It just felt like she didn't take me seriously at all. The following weeks she went out with the girls several times, and when she brought the girls to my place twice without notice, once with notice to appease me, her words, they all treated me like a butler, shaking their empty wine glasses at me for refills. After the fourth time, I made it clear that I will get a locked wine rack. Sharon just called me no fun after that. It gets worse. Sharon decided me and the girls got off on the wrong foot, and said we should have dinner together at a nice restaurant. Well, I went, and it was not great. The six kept prodding me about my life, my house, my career, but deflected every single question I asked. It got especially bad at night when they started talking about modern relationships and jealousy, and one of them brought up some key points about relationships that I thought Sharon and I were on the same page about specifically what ifs regarding polyamory and being friends with exes. To my shock, Sharon said we shouldn't be too hasty on such decisions, which was a total 180 to how she expressed herself on these things only a month prior, where she was vehemently against keeping ex-intimate partners in friend circles and was strictly monogamous. The worst part was when the bill arrived, Sharon announced it should be together and slid me the check. I told her she can't be serious, and we got into a bit of an argument. I ended it by putting my amount down in cash and walked out, leaving them to figure out the rest of the bill. The next days after that, Sharon kept calling me toxic and fragile, but every time I even pushed at it, she would give an apology and promise she was just stressed at work. It's nuts, we haven't even planned the wedding yet. The worst part was this Monday, when at work, I got a Nest doorbell alert, checked and saw Sharon and one of her six new friends arriving at my place, going in, and exiting with my golf clubs. This set was a gift from my father, and it cost a pretty penny too, so Sharon lending it out without my permission got me pissed. I immediately called Sharon and told her and her friend to return the clubs. Sharon tried to gaslight me with but you promised to lend the clubs to her boyfriend, remember? I told her the club's cost would move it into a serious crime, and her and her friend had an hour to return them or the cops would be called. Sharon kept insisted she got my permission and I told her to cut the crap. Well, not 45 minutes later I got another notification of Sharon and her friend coming back with the clubs and going inside, leaving them, and then Sharon's friend flipping off the Nest doorbell on the way out. I got home and saw Sharon's friend literally just threw the clubs right on the living room floor. Sharon tried to talk to me about my toxicity again, and I told her again to cut the crap. I said if I knew this was how she was, I would have never proposed. That seemed to freak her out and she again insisted that she was stressed from work, but I wasn't buying it anymore. I told her to return the ring and her key, and we would talk about our relationship this weekend. She cried and begged me not to cancel the engagement, and insisted that it was just stress. I told her again we will talk about it this weekend. She finally relented. I had my house rekeyed anyways after she left, just to be safe. 
Sharon has been texting me constant messages of love and apologies for getting swept up, and insisted she was only wanting to show me off to her close friends. I don't know, I'm just not buying it. The same close friends have been sending me texts daily, calling me toxic and fragile again, saying they knew I wasn't man enough for Sharon or secure enough to share her with friends. A few of my friends that knew Sharon the entire two years we were dating were surprised and can't believe she turned hide this quick, and that there must be something missing, or that I am leaving something out. They say I must have said something to trigger her friends to act like this, and I had to have been the jerk somewhere along the process. I dunno, it's a lot to take from all directions right now. I feel like everyone is playing a prank on me or something. Literally, how does this happen? Update two days later, Sharon's been gone now for an hour. The breakup is official, I have the ring back. I did talk to Michelle via Facebook and Michelle said her and Octavia were cousins of Sharon, and Michelle also said she knew the six and didn't care for them. Michelle didn't say much more than that. I did meet Sharon's parents, and they both seemed to like me, and the topic of Michelle and Octavia never came up around them. None of our finances were intermingled, yet, but it was planned for later this month, which won't ever happen now. I invited three of our mutual friends, Casey, John, and Mike, to be here when Sharon got here. Sharon showed up and was surprised to see we had company. I said they were here for both of our sakes. Sharon wanted to phone three of the six to come over to even things out and I refused, and I used the club theft as a reason. Sharon sat on the couch very dramatically and then asked if I really wanted to make this public. I outright asked why she changed so much after the engagement, and why she hid the existence of the six. Sharon then went in again about how she insulates her inner circle until a partner is vetted. I called bull crap, I met her parents, what's more inner circle than your parents? Sharon tried to deflect but I wouldn't have it. I pointed out how for the last month, her friends dropping by cost me nearly $500 in wine, which she by the way made no attempt to reimburse. I also pointed out her trying to make me pay an eight-person dinner bill without asking me first. She again said she wanted to show how great a guy I was, and how she clearly misjudged me and was disappointed in my attitude. I then asked about the clubs. She tried gaslighting with you totally said it was okay, remember? And I kept saying bull crap. Mike piped in, he knew the clubs were a gift from my dad and I was highly protective of them. He too called bull crap, and that's when Sharon turned her attention to Mike and John, saying isn't he getting forgetful lately? Don't you remember when he forgot that one date? And neither of them was buying it. I finally said forget postponing the wedding or cancelling the engagement, the entire relationship is going to end if she isn't going to be straight with me. Sharon made a very long exaggerated sigh. She took the ring off and dropped it on the coffee table. She got up to leave and said you're never going to find someone as good as me and to send her stuff to her apartment. She left, and Casey, John and Mike were totally stunned. All I could say was believe me now? Then we just ordered some pizza. I am still shocked and confused by her attitude. I'm sure the heartbreak will come next, but right now, I'm just kind of numb? I still feel like this isn't real lol. Story 10 I just found out from a co-worker that my husband secretly filmed us being intimate and posted it online, and after confronting him, I'm finding out there's even darker secrets he's been hiding. Last Friday I, 34 female, spent my evening with Kate, 24 female, who was a young friend from work as she wanted to discuss something personal with me. I didn't think anything of it as we do have a very personal relationship outside of work as well. As soon as I arrived to her place the tension in the air was thick. She explained that she wanted to discuss a serious matter with me but that she didn't know how to go about it. I told her to just rip the band-aid off and tell me. She told me that she had found two recordings of a woman she believed to be me on an adult website. I told her that wouldn't be possible but she was adamant that I was the woman in the recording. And she was right. I've never recorded myself exposed or making love with my husband but there I was in two recordings of seven minutes and four minutes both of them recorded in our old bedroom. As I rewatched every second of it, it starts to dawn on me that this was my husband's doing. But I pushed that deep down because there must be a reasonable explanation for this. Honestly I left her place with my mind in a complete meltdown. I could barely hear what she was saying but she did follow up with a text saying she's been in contact with a website about getting it taken down and that she'll help me go through this. She also said she's scouring the internet in case there are more out there. I came home and pretty much ransacked my house looking for evidence and I found it. My husband was using a hidden spy cameras to spy on me and record me in my most intimate moments. I then just spent hours vomiting, crying, projectile vomiting some more and begging God to just let this be a nightmare. I am a deeply religious and a fully veiled Muslim woman and I've never been with anyone but my husband and all this time he has been sharing my most intimate moments with the world. I don't know what to think or what to do. I can't look at him or speak to him. I've locked myself in our bedroom pretending I'm sick. All I do is look up how other people have dealt with getting things removed and it seems like once it's on the internet it really is forever even if I remove it from this one website. I've been crying non-stop. He truly must be something demonic as he is right now talking about ordering in some of my favorites to see if I have an appetite since I haven't been eating well. I am so unbelievably hurt. I don't know how to share this with my family or how to ask for help, I'm crippled with shame, anger and pain. Answering some questions, 1. My husband, soon to be ex-husband, and I are the same religion, race, ethnicity and nationality. Two. My culture does not participate in honor killings and I'm not afraid of my family harming me or not siding with me. 3. My family would support me in divorcing him, in fact they would demand I do. 
4. The laws in my country are secular but in certain circumstances it allows for the various religious groups in the country to hold their own courts that can enforce their rulings, as long as it doesn't impose or break secular law or civil liberties. 5. I do plan on taking this to secular court and religious court if I want him punished. 6. I am veiled by choice and the vast majority of my fellow country women do not veil. 7. I am a nikabi meaning the only part of me visible to the public are my eyes. When I am with my family or with other women or in women-only spaces, I don't veil. 8. Kate and I do not share the same religion, nor dress alike and yet we are friends, Kel surprise. First update, I left him as I said I would. He went to work. The movers arrived, we packed my stuff and we left. The entire time I was crying to the point that even the movers were worried for me but I couldn't stop myself from crying. I went home sat my parents and siblings down, and explained the situation. My parents were and still are confused. They are elderly and fragile. They don't understand the internet. They just keep saying okay let's talk to the people and it will be gone. But my siblings understand. They are angry. They are sad and heartbroken on my behalf. My siblings and brother-in-laws took me home. We waited for him and well, we had a conversation with him. He denied it at first. So my brothers were firm with him and he started to be more truthful. He said he did it because he was depressed, because he had an adult video addiction, love making addiction and because he didn't think anyone would see it. He said he posted only a few. When we asked him to be specific he said he posted anything from 5 to 8. We had him take it down but who knows how many times it has been downloaded or shared. In that moment I also found out he had a secret phone. He was also cheating on me with random women and street workers. All this time I was thinking he's working hard but nope, he was out disgracing himself and betraying our marriage. At some point he convinced us he needed to use the bathroom and he somehow managed to call his mother. Who arrived at our home with his brother and cousins. There was a commotion as they were angry at the treatment of their family member. Then things calmed down enough to explain to them what he had done. His mother fainted. His mother is elderly and not in the greatest health condition. We called for an ambulance. My neighbor had also called the police and I was arrested by the time the ambulance arrived to take care of my mother-in-law. I spent the evening locked up. Didn't exactly have a polite conversation with him. So yes I was arrested for assaulting him, specifically slapping him, and he refused to press charges. Got released the next morning and went home to my parents. Cried some more because my parents kept crying. Then a few days later I spoke to some lawyers my sister had contacted as they had experience with non-consensual material being posted online. They have been handling things with the police as I did press charges and they are dealing with the websites. I also have started the process of divorce. I went to the clinic and got tested and luckily he didn't give me anything so far but I have another test scheduled just to make sure. I have spoken to his mother and she apologized to me even though it's not her fault. She told me that she understood why I want him punished. She asked that I let it stay in the hands of the law rather than I hurt him or have him hurt. He's in hiding but he still calls and texts me from random numbers. He still lies and tries to manipulate me. I've just been documenting everything he says and texts to me. Oh at this point everyone knows. I mean everyone, even little kids. And I feel more humiliated now than I did at first. Second update, this man has destroyed everything I have worked for and has completely destroyed the very little sense of stability and safety I had left. I had to resign from my job. A job that I loved. Jobs don't come easy for me with the way that I look. I can't work there anymore because I am a potential danger to the children and staff. Since perverted men have started to harass me at work, I work with vulnerable children and mothers who have heard about me have started to refuse me working with their children. Some don't want me to be involved with their child because their husbands can't stop being weird. Fathers have leered at me or made lewd comments toward me and one of them even offered me money to get with him. Men have catcalled me with greater frequency than ever before. Men stare at me. A man followed me from my dentist office and groped me on the street. Random men call my phone, my family home and office to verbally abuse me because my husband has posted my address, my personal and work email, phone numbers, workplace address and every other bit of information online. It is as if the eyes and judgment of the entire world is on me. Yes the great majority of people are sympathetic, kind and in support of me. Many people have reached out in support of me, from old classmates to former colleagues, neighbors, members of my religious community, family friends, his family and many many more have expressed solidarity and kindness but the crazies and pervs who believe him and are like him, are bolder, louder and much more noticeable. Then I find out from my lawyers and their investigators that he was drugging me and doing this stuff to me as I slept. I suffer from migraines and insomnia and take medication for it. He saw my medication as opportunity to drug me with my own prescriptions. He shared, was actually bragging, on a forum where other pervs congregate how he was so clever for drugging me with my own medication and they were encouraging him to do more things to me. My soon-to-be ex-husband has also decided to spread rumors that I was aware of the cameras and pressured him into posting online and there are people who believe him. He also changed his mind about not pressing charges. I went to court. The judge and prosecutors were sympathetic and dismissed the case. It was a combination of my lawyers explaining the circumstances that led to me slapping him and his subsequent actions, threatening me, attacking me, doxing me and blackmailing me by saying he didn't care about the slap, and that he would drop everything if I forgave him. 
My lawyers used his own words against him since he wrote it in text, and on a recorded call he admitted to me not having slapped him that hard and that he only pressed charges to cause me harm. But his crimes against me are still being investigated by the prosecutors. Third post, it all boils down to jealousy and me emasculating him. I wish I could say I was feeling better or doing better but I feel awful, and I am still struggling with everything. It is still his life's mission to be as cruel as he can be and to stand in the way of every step I make. He is still refusing to work with my divorce lawyer, he continues to be difficult every step of the way and has run off his own lawyers. He is now in his third lawyer and we are again starting from scratch in the divorce negotiations. He has been granted an extension by the courts due to his last lawyer just dropping him a few days before our hearing. As for posting non-consensual material, a trial date was scheduled and he recently asked for an extension and he'll probably be granted it as his criminal lawyer dropped him too. So in last month he has been dropped by his divorce lawyer and his criminal lawyer. The man is on a roll. When it rains it sure pours, my father passed a little over a month ago and my mother is now in hospice care as she is soon to go back to God. I'm sad but not shocked about this as I've had a long time to prepare for it. My father had been battling cancer for almost three years and so was as prepared as a person can be and my mother's health had been declining significantly for years due to her dementia. Soon to be ex-husband decided it was a great idea to corner me at the venue we held the after funeral meal at. He decided to wait for me to be alone, he approached me as I was cleaning up the venue. I was on my own and at that time I was kind of exhausted and could not muster up the rage to chase him off as I had done many times before. So I just let him talk. He seemed almost decent as he was giving his million excuses on why things were the way they were. He cried about how awful he feels for hurting me. Then he started telling me about how he always felt I was better than him and everything as I made more money, was better educated, had been better traveled than him and that he felt jealous of my confidence and how in the beginning these were things that he was most attracted to but as our relationship and marriage progressed these were the things he started to dislike about me. He also said that he was angry that I refused to consider being a stay-at-home wife and mother even though he knew from the beginning that I wasn't the stay-at-home slash homemaker type. He said that he tried to be a good husband but that my refusal to bend or let him have the last say in things was the catalyst for his anger and need to humiliate me. He talked about how he had always had addiction issues but he thought that if he was married he would be cured of his depression, his adult video and love-making addiction and he felt like if I ever found out I would have never married him and or would divorce him and then it angered him and pushed him to want to punish me for thinking I was better than him. He was jealous and angry about so many things. But when I said to him, so you hurt me because you felt jealous and inadequate in comparison, he lost his mind and started to shout and say that he knew I would react that way. I decided to refrain from commenting further and just let him spill his guts uninterrupted. For three hours he made excuse after excuse for why he did what he did. But it all comes down to him feeling inferior to me, him being jealous and angry that I dared have a mind and life of my own. He said right before our wedding he joined a men's group online that were helping him deal with his addictions and one tip given was to make your own adult videos and watch that instead, but he knew I'd never agree to it, so it was my fault that he needed to spy on me and that he never intended to share it with others, but one day I had angered him so much and as payback he posted it and he felt good. And so every time I emasculated him by having my own mind or upset him in some way or another he would post more. Eventually he gained a following and had so many men asking him to post more, that he started to like the fact that other men looked up to him for his intimate prowess and at the same time his addiction started to come back and he fell back into his habit of picking up women, and when he couldn't get it for free, he'd hire a street worker. Then I guess it spiraled out of control for him. The more he spent on his addictions, the more lies he told the more he felt like a failure for me covering our expenses the more he resented me and he got stuck in a cycle of self-destruction which in turn only fueled his anger with me. He also says he joined a support group for addicts and started going to an addiction rehabilitation clinic as an outpatient to deal with his issues and that I should give him credit for that. He feels that I should be proud of him for doing that and that I should take him back since he's putting in so much work. He also feels I should appreciate him not stalking me since my dad died and he is sincere in feelings this way. He genuinely doesn't understand why I'm not seeing how hard he's been trying the past few months. In his deluded mind he thinks that his honesty in our conversation should count for something and that I am just being a heartless jerk for having been stoic and unmoved by his tears and his show of vulnerability. Even though he gave a great performance of being human during our conversation, I remained unmoved by it because there was nothing to be moved about. I just continued to pack things up from the venue and got in my car and went home. I'm still not working, I still have crazy men calling my phone at all hours of the day and I still feel humiliated and embarrassed. The only good thing that has happened is that several of the sites have taken down the recordings and banned him from using their platforms. Fourth post, curses are like young chickens, they always come home to roost. Finally I have some good news, so a while back, I was granted a restraining and protective order and my now officially ex-husband did continue to stalk and harass me. After the umpteenth time of calling the police and going to court he was finally imprisoned, and he has been in prison for a little over a month. I was also granted my divorce. I initially wanted a quick divorce and wanted to just give him everything he asked for but he kept finding ways to delay or asking for more and more, and I just snapped, so I told my lawyers to do their worst and they did. My lawyers hated him and I got everything I wanted and way way more. Not to gloat but it was really satisfying seeing him cry. This has been the most peaceful month I've had in a long time. 
This entire time has been such a trying time and it has affected my mental and physical health. I've lost 12 kilograms and I've lost a ton of hair due to the stress he was causing me. But I can honestly say that him wailing in court was the chicken soup my soul needed. I've moved from my city and now live on the other side of the country and I've gotten myself a decent enough job. I am slowly mending my confidence. I am in therapy and I can't say it's working right now but I know if I stick with it, it will. The non-consensual material he posted has been removed from the more reputable websites he posted on and my lawyers were able to get me monetarily compensated as these companies didn't want to go to court over it. I mean money doesn't really change things that much and I'm still hurt but at least it's something. I'm also not so delusional as to think that it isn't still out there in some way or another and I know there really isn't much I could ever do about that, so I'm just trying to make peace with it. Ex-husband will be serving time in prison for what he did my lawyers are working with the courts and that should be sorted soon enough. I think the reality of the consequences are becoming very clear to him as I have heard through the grapevine that he attempted to take his life and is now in protective custody until his trail date. He is facing up to 30 years in corporal punishment and I absolutely look forward to it. Story 11. My dad's friend has been patronizing and belittling me for years, but when he crossed the line at a family party, I finally told him I hated him, and now my dad's not speaking to me. Years ago, my dad met Harold through mutual friends, and they hit it off. I was 18 and in college when I met him, and we never had a close relationship. However, he always seemed to think of himself as a family friend, and was extremely infantilizing and condescending towards me. Every time I saw him, I try to tell myself it wasn't that bad, only for him to prove me wrong less than a minute later. Harold would disrespect my boundaries, say things like, you're not 19, you're a baby, while I was talking to other people and patronize me, my education or my hobbies whenever he had the chance. He always noticed that annoyed me, to which he'd playfully ask if I hated him. I always said no, but only for my father's sake. The final straw came the day Harold interrupted a barbecue to say, I really like you, even though you're an impolite brat. I was 20 years old. I'd been quiet all day, working on a paper during the barbecue, but replied patiently and politely whenever anyone addressed me. And even if that hadn't been the case, I knew he didn't have the right to talk to me like that. After that, I started making an effort to avoid any events I knew he'd be attending. Yesterday was my father's girlfriend's birthday. They threw a small lunch party at my dad's apartment. I went there with my fiancé and our six-month-old son. Harold was there. I hadn't seen him in months, but he still talked to me as if I was a dumb child. Never mind that I'm engaged, a mother, and 26 years old. I spent the whole party ignoring his helpful advice about me being too young to get married or be a mom. It helped that most of the other guests seemed to disagree with him. My baby spent most of the afternoon sleeping, there's a bassinet in my old room. He woke up hungry, so I went to breastfeed him and excused myself from the party for a while. I got back to jokes and comments, all from Harold, about how I was probably struggling if my son was managing to leech me away for so long. He went on to interrupt a conversation I was having with another of my dad's friends to question pretty much everything about my parenting, he doesn't even have custody of his daughter by the way, and to make more comments about my age. I decided I couldn't take it anymore after he asked if I thought about giving my baby up for adoption. I got my son and told my fiancé we were leaving. We said goodbye to everyone except Harold. When we got to the door, Harold came to ask why we were leaving. I tried to make up an excuse, but he kept trying to make us stay. After a small back and forth, he jokingly asked if I hated him. And this time, I said, yes, I do. Can we go now? He didn't say anything, and we left. On the way home, my fiancé said he was proud of me. My father called this morning to say the opposite, and we had a small fight, but ultimately decided to drop the subject. I'm sure this isn't over, but if it keeps going, it won't be because of me. This is far from my proudest moment, and a small part of me regrets it, but I'm done with that guy. Update 8 days later, hey guys. I wasn't going to write an update, but I just got some free time and I figured I'd fill you in. I'll start by addressing the, very frequent, assumption that Harold has feelings for me. I really don't think that's the case. His comments always came out as annoying and condescending, but never intimate but I will say that your comments scared the crap out of me. And the fact that the general consensus was fuck Harold was weirdly heartwarming. I also want to add that, while I did regret what I said a little bit, I never doubted I'd done the right thing. I think most of my regret came from the fact that my eight years of keeping the peace were over. It took some time for the relief to sink in. Truth be told, I've been wanting to do this since the barbecue incident, which was when I went from I don't like that guy to I can't stand that guy. My father called Harold the day after I made my previous post. When confronted about the adoption comment, he tried to twist it as him being genuinely concerned about me being a mom so soon, and that he didn't think I knew what I was doing. He did apologize to my father. I don't buy any of that. The next day, my dad told me about the call. He said I should forgive Harold for what he thought was an honest misunderstanding. He also told me I should apologize too, since I'd overreacted by telling Harold I hated him for such a small reason. Many of Harold's past comments were made with my father close by. It often happened in the middle of conversations with other people, so he'd be too distracted to register them. He also wouldn't notice them most of the time. My dad doesn't pay enough attention to anything that doesn't either concern or anger him, and he'll most likely forget it until he gets angry at something else later anyway. 
He's like a meth head goldfish. We also have different definitions of what's offensive, so he'd never think they were a big deal. I told my father I wasn't exaggerating when I said I hated Harold, and that the adoption comment was far from being the only reason. I listed most of the condescending treatment and comments I could remember, including the ones from the party. He didn't remember any of them. I made it very clear that I'd hated Harold for years prior to the party, and that I had nothing to apologize for. I then stated that I'm no longer coming to any events Harold is invited to. My father doesn't need to stop being friends with him, or even stop inviting him to stuff, but he can no longer expect me to show up as well. I will ask him beforehand, and if he lies, I'll leave. My father called me dramatic, but I pointed out that I've been avoiding Harold for six years now and no one even noticed, so it clearly wasn't a problem. I've only seen him a handful of times since the barbecue incident, and only twice for more than a few minutes, the lunch party last week and another party back when I was pregnant. It clearly didn't ruin my father's life. I'm not obliged to like his friends any more than he is to like mine. There was some back and forth, but he agreed to my terms. We spoke yesterday about something else, and he mentioned Harold was upset. I ignored that. I'm not going no contact with my father. Yes, I'm very well aware he's a jerk, and I came really close to cutting ties with him in the last few years, but I ultimately decided it wouldn't really fix anything. Maintaining my relationship with him has gotten a lot easier since I moved out, as we only see each other a couple times a month. He gets frustrated that I don't call or text much, but doesn't complain about it anymore. I don't see the point in going no contact with someone who no longer has any say in how I live my life. I'd rather just take note of what my father did wrong when I was growing up and then make sure to raise my own kid differently. He's on thin ice though, and has been for some time. He's not allowed to babysit, mostly because I don't trust him to spend more than an hour alone with a baby without falling asleep on the couch. I began pushing for him to start doing therapy back when I got pregnant, and he finally got started back in June. His behavior around me and my younger sister, who still lives between our very divorced parents, has improved a lot since, and I've made it clear to him that he won't be allowed near my son if he stops attending. This is the first time in my life my father has improved his behavior. It's hard to be hopeful, but I'm trying. And if I ever do go no contact with my father, it won't be because of Harold. So that's it. Overall, I'm glad I don't have to deceive anyone anymore. My relationship with my father is rocky, but I won't dwell on it. My main responsibilities are my son, my fiancé and my job, and that's not changing anytime soon. And to those who mentioned Jesus Christ Superstar and Blue Oyster Cult in my last post, has anyone told you you're freaking awesome today? Because you are. New update one year and one month later, hey guys. Wow, I can't believe it's been over a year since I last posted about this. I planned on updating some time ago. These past few months, I've been caught up in raising a toddler, getting married, yay, working like crazy and re-watching Supernatural. Needless to say, I've been busy. Openly avoiding Harold has been working pretty well. My father has been respecting my boundaries. Whenever he invites me and my husband over for lunch or dinner, I ask who else will be there. If Harold's coming, he tells me. He hasn't lied so far, and doesn't usually insist when I tell him I'm not coming. Since my last post, I've only seen Harold once, at my dad's birthday party a few months ago. Yes, I knew he'd be there. My father promised he'd tell him not to talk to me. Also, some of my father's friend's kids, most of whom I used to babysit, would be there. I hadn't seen them in a while, and I love them more than I hate Harold. I ended up spending most of the party with my son and the kids. Harold didn't talk to me at all, so I guess my father was true to his word. My husband and I did catch him staring at us a couple times, but I decided to ignore it. I caught my husband staring back once, and the walking marshmallow I married actually managed to look threatening. I love this man. You know who did talk to me? Harold's girlfriend. Yes, he has one now. She interacted with me twice. First, she came over to coo over my son before making a comment about how he needed a haircut, ha 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 I already hate you. Later, she approached me and said you're shy, aren't you? I said no, she laughed and said yeah, you're shy. She said all that in the same tone one would use to talk to a six-year-old. I managed to keep my expression schooled. Otherwise, I would have told her I'm not shy, I just chose to spend the whole party with the kids because they were better company than her and her annoying ass boyfriend. So yeah, based on both my interactions with her, Harold's girlfriend is insufferable. In other words, they're perfect for each other. I don't have much else to add. My father broke up with the woman he was dating last year, long freaking story, and has a new girlfriend. She is not annoying or psychotic, and I actually really like her. They won't last a year. My relationship with my father is still not perfect, by the way, but it has improved. He's actually started apologizing to me a lot more often. I don't know whether it's the therapy or the fact that motherhood has apparently made me terrifying, but I'll take it. And I'll give credit where it's due, he's a very good grandfather. I'm also glad my father is respecting this Harold boundary. I very much don't want this man in my life. Honestly, I'm pretty satisfied right now. My little boy is thriving. Part of me really misses the baby times, but I grow prouder and prouder every day. Getting to know my kid has been fantastic.